Hello everybody, and the volume's okay now. Hello everybody, and welcome to the 1000th uh, video special. The other day I put up um, a quick little video asking you guys for questions, because we haven't done any on the channel for ages. Uh, I, I kind of missed it a little bit, and I thought why not put out one really long Q&A video for the 1000th that we end up doing, and also I opened up to more personal stuff as well, because I never talk about that on the channel. So um, yeah, what you'll be seeing here is, I don't know how long this is going to get, I've got myself a, a lot of water to drink as I go though. Should it roll on for for like over an hour then then so be it. I kind of just want it the, the longer the better if you ask me because the longer the video gets kind of the the more special it end up being. But yeah, so um hope you enjoy this. If it does end up quite long, don't be scared to I don't know, remember where you were, pause it, stop watching and come back. Uh, hopefully it doesn't put people off, but anyway, yeah. So um, what I'm going to do is, as I say, I asked for a lot of questions from you guys. All I'm literally going to do is go on to that YouTube video and read the comment section from bottom to top, picking out, you know, reasonable questions from it, and I'll just answer whatever I answer as I go through. And then when we're done, I'll check uh, any personal messages and stuff, because I know some people ask me in other areas, just in case there's something that we haven't covered. And yeah, I guess we'll go from there. Um, this is a bit of a weird one for me because uh, I'm going to be saying a lot of stuff I don't usually say, but hey. Anyway, so actually it turns out the first question came from... Oh yeah, the footage in the background as well, I should mention, is this is all going to be old footage from my channel. Just significant moments from the original Let's Play I did that took ages, like well over a year and a half to complete, uh, and then the various things that we've done going on from that, not necessarily just Guild Wars 2 stuff, all the questions here won't necessarily just be Guild Wars 2 stuff either, but uh, I'm going to just be putting up all the kind of really memorable moments for me at least, and depending how lazy I feel I'll put on a little bit of flavour text there as well explaining why, so hopefully there should be something interesting to see as well, and if you've been watching the channel for quite a while, maybe you'll see some old stuff uh, in there that you might have forgotten about I know I'll be seeing stuff that I haven't forgotten about yet I haven't prepared all that side, but I'm kind of looking forward to it because I tell you, as time goes on, even though I knew so much about Guild Wars and have probably covered absolutely everything I ever can for the first game at least, a lot of it is, I've already forgotten about, which comes across as a bit of a shame really if you ask me because um, I know there's some really interesting small things, particularly like in the story, that some people I know have asked me, hey, what kind of lore would you go forward with? And had you asked me like two years ago, I probably could have reeled off loads of tiny little things that probably arena net themselves don't necessarily remember but i saw and was inspired about long great stories and stuff but hey we'll see what happens anyway so the first question uh came from the first few comments weren't even questions the first question one wasn't a guild wars one it was from sci sci 751 who said what uni did you graduate at and what is your area of expertise also will we ever see your face i mean shit man two questions there straight away that I got asked a lot about my face uh, here. I might show you something on this video later and if I don't end up doing it, it depends because okay I'll, I'll explain why I haven't ever really shown myself. It's not because I'm necessarily embarrassed about showing myself. I think I actually look alright and I do well in front of cameras and stuff and I've got lots of pictures of myself and things going on. In fact, I do, for my own personal benefit, I do vlog stuff to tell you the truth, which I'm sure you all hate to hear because I don't upload it. But every now and then I do, I, I film myself quite frequently, but I've never really wanted it to be a big part of the channel. Um, as time's gone on, more and more people have been asking for me to show myself, but... I don't know, I quite like the, you know, the other thing is as well that a lot of people have been asking me is, hey, what's your name, what's your real life name? I've always kept everything I've ever done on YouTube as well as real life stuff really, really separate. You know, as far as YouTube stuff goes, I very rarely talk about my friends and my family. And in real life, uh, some of my closest friends in real life don't even know that I, I do YouTube stuff. And I'm not sure why I've always been so inclined to do it that way. But now that I'm, I'm, you know, quite a few years in, I quite like that there is this kind of air or a little bit of mystery about, oh, who, who am I? For the purposes of a lot of videos, I, I just come on and I'm this wooden potatoes guy, which... Actually, in a recent video I mentioned, I don't actually think it's the greatest pseudonym uh, at all, to be honest, because it doesn't roll off of the tongue. It's not some, like, single syllable thing that people can refer to me as. Uh, but then it would seem really weird to try and brand myself with a different name this late in. I think maybe in the coming months or weeks or, or years, depending on how stuff with YouTube goes, I might eventually start being far more open about it. I will put out, you know, proper vlog videos where you see me and I talk about my real life and I give you my my real name and stuff, but I'm not sure it would be now. 
Uh, there is growing pressure to do it. Uh, I'm, I'm a part of the TGS at the moment, and I did speak with a guy a fair few months ago who was saying, you know, he, he wanted my channel to grow and stuff, and he was basically saying, look, anyone that's successful on this website has to show themselves eventually. You know, it's a very personality-driven website, and if you're just a voice, it will only get you so far. Yes, I have a British voice, but it will only get you so far, so... I don't know, eventually, maybe, but it's not something I'm too keen on. I do like this idea that nobody really knows right now, and that sits well with me. Uh, on the other hand, though, I think maybe I can get around it, possibly. I might, later on in this video, depending, because there's another question someone's going to ask me later, I might show you an old video of me from, like, seven, maybe even eight years ago, like when I was a teenager. Uh, and that might be interesting to show you guys because then it's still like I look quite different I had a lot more hair back then than I do now But it could be a nice way of showing you guys w what I look like my only problem there is it's a very short video And it looks like it's filmed with a potato so uh, no pun intended there It, it, it does look terrible and uh, you don't see me very much in it So maybe it would disappoint people. I'm not sure. We'll see. We'll see. I'll, I'll come back to it later um, Anyway, the other bit of the question what uni did I graduate at and what's my area of expertise? So in England we have like over in the states you have high school and then you go off to university or as you guys call it college but where I'm from um, we do college after high school sort of except we end high school in quotes a little bit earlier um, so college to me was something quite different but when I went to college I, I got the choice to specialize in four different things I left school with pretty good grades and a really keen interest in science Mainly that was where I got some of my best grades and I really enjoyed that and found that stuff interesting But I think like a lot of other people when I left school I had no idea really what I wanted to do um, And at the time that I left I'd been watching a lot of uh, lost like ex bonus DVDs on lost Okay, because uh, I had like the box set for season two or something and I had no idea what I wanted to pick What, what these four subjects were that I wanted to specialize in but at the time for me I'm like really all or nothing I get really into something for a while and then and then I'm just not interested in it anymore And I knew that even back then but the only thing I was interested in at the mo at that moment was uh, because of these bonus DVDs talking about the production of the, the episodes of this show and stuff, uh, I was really quite into the idea of working in the film industry. Uh, which even at the time I knew was just going to be a passing fancy, but it's all I had to go on. So when I got to college, which remember isn't quite university, but when I got to college I picked film and media. Uh, which to this day I, I very much regret. They were interesting subjects to study there, but I came out of college having two of my subjects being basically soft A levels. They they weren't you know necessarily the nicest looking A levels to go into a university. And of course by the time I'd finished my college education, uh, I knew that I didn't want to get into the film industry whatsoever. So again, I found myself leaving college in the same situation I left original school, thinking, well, I have no idea what I want to do. The other two subjects I took were English, English language, and psychology, which I did quite well, particularly in English language. I even got accepted to universities to study English language with, at the time, quite a good friend of mine that I thought might be interesting to go. Um, but my heart was never in it. I, I enjoyed the subject, but I knew for a fact, and no offence to anybody that's, you know, gone and got an English degree or anything, but I knew that it wouldn't really put me in any specific job or any direction that I really wanted to go in. I was really scared about spending a ton of money on a university education for a degree that I would never use, which I know a lot of people fall into that trap. Uh, and I, I was worried about it. I also didn't get a lot of pressure from home to go to university. Um, none of my family ever really went. It wasn't that they didn't want me to go, but there wasn't much pressure on that end either. So I decided not to go. At the time I was working at a supermarket, um, I finished college and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. My psychology teacher, I, uh, I, I feel like I was quite close with, and he talked to me a lot about living an unconventional life. Namely at the time I was very keen on traveling. Uh, I really wanted to travel the world to see everything. I was kind of at the right age for it then. really wanted to get out there. And that was something he'd done too. And he talked at great length about how life is longer than people would have you think when you're young. You know, you think you have to get your education nice and early and you have to get into a career nice and early so you can do this, this, this and this. You know, there's this real rush. Um, and he was kind of saying, you know, there will always be opportunities. And if you don't know what you want right now, which I think most people don't really know what they want. Uh, he was kind of saying, if you don't know what you want right now, in terms of a career, just follow your desires. And maybe by the time you, you've experienced the world and gone traveling, you'll come away from that with a real understanding of where your place is in the world and what you want to do, which sounded fantastic to me. Uh, but I didn't have much money. Uh, so I ended up working for like a year and a half 
uh, after I'd finished college at the supermarket, just not really doing anything, slowly picking the hours up. And I got really scared. You see it all the time. You see people that kind of get stuck in jobs like that. And I was working with people that had got stuck in jobs like that and just never left because suddenly the idea of becoming a supervisor, you know, I was in a bakery. So the idea of becoming a supervisor or a manager here or there uh, in what is essentially a crappy job anyway becomes really alluring to people. And I saw a lot of people I was working with that had been stuck there and they were now, you know, well into their 30s. And again, I guess it was the fear that I I was going to fall into something I didn't want to do. So I, I just quit my supermarket job with nothing else to go in uh, except the the small savings that I really had at the time because I wasn't that good at saving. A lot of people in my house think I'm good at saving, but I wasn't that good at saving. Uh, and I just lived off of those instead of traveling. I really should have gone and traveled. Uh, I lived off of those and that really... Um, when I was unemployed for that period of time, uh, that was when I started doing the videos. That was when I started doing Guild Wars 1 stuff. I'm sure there'll be more questions later about why I, I started with videos, so I won't get into that too much. But that's when I started that, and uh, there was more career stuff later on, which I'll get into too. I just realised, you asked me about my university, and I've just gone and talk about everything else. So anyway, no, I didn't go to university. Now, looking back, I would love to go back to university. There's quite a few subjects. I was talking about sciences before, uh, particularly like two years ago. I was really keen on going back to study biology I was really into the idea of going into like research for um, aging prevention uh, biogerontology I believe was that was the field and I, I read a lot about that and I really wanted to get into that I actually remember when Minecraft survival multiplayer first came out I was playing it on a server with the Guild Wars 2 guru guys and I'd, I'd been drinking that day uh, I'd got in and then I, I went on and started playing with those guys and I started just rambling and ranting about how I really want to do this this job and everyone in the server was like oh that's such a cool idea yeah and that really motivated me to do it um really did i'd already like started trying to apply for stuff before then but uh yeah i remembered feeling really awesome that this would be the greatest career and to an extent i still think it would i'm still really i would love to be in that area I even applied to go to university for that. I found some great universities that were offering foundation years. You know, I still had reasonable A-levels. They were just all in the wrong subject. So I was going to go back to uni, um, but basically do an extra year so I could get the grounding in the sciences that I needed. But around that time as well, we had kind of a new government came in and suddenly it cost like three times as much to go to uni. I didn't get into the university I really wanted to. I was put off. I, You know, I'm so all or nothing, like because it wasn't the very best one that I wanted there, I got really put off. And again, it fell through, so that was kind of twice I wanted to go. I think it's still on the table. I'm getting older, and a lot of people kind of think, oh, you can't go once you're too old, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see if in 10 years' time I'd retaken a lot of my education and, and gone back, because I do really believe that life is long, and if you worry too much, as I always have, if you worry too much that time's running out, then it will run out because you made it run out rather than the truth. You know, people live for a long time. I think even a 50-year-old could go off to pursue a totally different career and go to university. You know, where there's a world, there's a way. And, you know, so anyway, uh, uni is still something I'd be very much interested in. But I'm a bit, I don't know, one of the more uneducated ones, I'd say, which my accent would lie to you about. You know, a lot of my friends now are at university. I don't see them so much. Um, and I've kind of just fallen behind in that regard. But anyway... So sorry, anyway, we'll, we'll go to a Guild Wars 2 question. I'm sure some people really want that. I may have to put an annotation there to the first Guild Wars 2 question. Um, what's my favourite part of question Guild Wars 2? Sorry, from Spirit Wolf 963 That's a really generic question, isn't it? I don't know, do you mean in terms of overall mechanics, overall design? I think uh, ArenaNet did really well overhauling the, the, the traditional questing system. Honestly, I know that's such an easy answer to come out with, but it really does change the face of what it's like to play Guild Wars 2 as opposed to other MMOs. I think the driving philosophy that ArenaNet have that MMO should be social games rather than competitive games, essentially. You know, people always competing over resource nodes and, and tagging mobs that have spawned in other MMOs. ArenaNet really wanted to drive away from that, and obviously the dynamic event system was born very much into that philosophy. And I think they did it really well. I do think it comes with its downsides, though. I put out a video where I think, where I explained that traditional quests can be far more... Um, far-reaching than dynamic events can be, which I do think is a flaw in the system. Uh, but in general, I think that that's what... You know, the MMO space is crowded at the moment. Everyone wants to be what WoW got. I don't think anyone ever will be what WoW got, and WoW still has. It's always such big news when, like, WoW drops a million or two million subs, but then they always get them back when expansions come out. I, I don't think anyone can take over WoW because of the nature of MMOs, how social they are. People like that 
assurance that they have a community to go to in those games and there's always something to do in those games it's very easy for new mmos and it's happened to guild wars 2 honestly uh where people will just kind of they'll flock to it but then leave again and a lot in a lot of ways i think guild wars 1's model where they were basically saying Look, there's not that much in the way of end game content here, but we do promise you every six months there will be another expansion. So it's okay to buy the game, stop playing, there's no sub fee, and then come back for a future expansion. I think that whole model they had back there actually is more relevant and more useful today than it was back in Guild Wars 1's time. And we all saw that with Guild Wars 1, even on that model, eventually they had tons of end game uh, and things for people to be able to play and do and keep them going even when we had this long wait between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2. Um, but I, I guess I've talked myself off the topic a little bit. What I'm saying is that Guild Wars 2 did something right with the dynamic event system because it's such a crowded space this is one key thing they've changed that actually allows them to have their own niche. You know, they're their own small portion that actually allows them to succeed. Because I don't think you can do exactly what WoW did and become World of Warcraft. You can't emulate that because people already have that. You need, and this is true with so many things in the world, you need to be unique in some way. And Guild Wars 2 has really done that. We'll have to see what the Elder Scrolls in lines like because they seem to take a lot of pages out of Guild Wars 2. Um, but that's kind of the one large thing that, that I would say makes Guild Wars 2 a, a worthy game for me. Of course, there are a million little things out there. Like I say, it's quite a vague question, so I'll go with the vague answer. There you go. Uh, the next question is from XX Savage Beast XX. Lovely name. Your favourite Guild Wars and Guild Wars 2 moment? Also, I want to know your favourite, if any, RPG game. Uh, okay. Uh, well, for the first one, favourite Guild Wars and Guild Wars 2 moment? You know, I think that my, my Guild Wars 2 moment is probably quite a sad one because I think it came from the betas, honestly. Um, I, I've got to say, I think my favourite moment from Guild Wars 2 was my first experience of Garenhof. Seeing the Wizard's Tower, a piece of old, mysterious lore, be exaggerated upon so much and so openly uh, expanded upon in Guild Wars 2 with all the mystery in, and intrigue in this little village that I'd managed to get to and was quiet and it, there seemed to be all these hints of things to come was, was fantastic. It was a really ma magical moment for me. And because it was right at the start of the betas as well, it was one of those situations where it fills your mind with wonders of what the rest of the world of Tyria can be like. And that was a fantastic moment. Back then, I was incredibly optimistic about how good Ore could look. I mean, if you take just the the lore about Ore before Guild Wars 2 came out, and you develop an image of what that place looks like in your mind, you get this incredible thing that Ore could have been. And and this amazing story of, you know, the, the Ara, the city of the gods, and the massive epic conclusion that Guild Wars 2 could have in this this city with the statues of the gods around and a fight versus an elder dragon and i will say to the game's credit the final mission of guild wars 2 is very cinematic but it's nothing like what i really imagined anyway um so that might have been what my favorite moment is what i'm trying to say i would have liked to to have been ara and or but really it just ended up quite grimy um and in, in places quite beautiful honestly like explorable ara when you just first get out and you see the huge uh, like structures and architecture of the domes arcing around into the center of the city and you see like the water seeping down through the cracks and dripping around it looks brilliant it looks absolutely fantastic but it didn't quite catch it for me. It didn't catch that mystery. Um, and I guess my optimism for the exciting things that were to, to come was highest when I first found Garenhof. So that was that really stands out for me for Guild Wars 2. That was one of the moments. Uh, like a, a non-mechanical mo moment anyway. Uh, for Guild Wars 1... You have to understand. I was playing this game for so long. Like seven years or whatever it was. For, for so long that... It, I find it hard to do favourites for things because it just seems to disregard every other amazing moment that came from something. One that sticks out though that I kind of want to mention just because I think a lot of people forget about um, was the first time I ever reached the Hall of Heroes in Guild Wars 1. I went through a bit of a phase before I was a part of the guild or the alliance which had the guild which I'm now in before all of that before I knew basically anyone who I interact with now I went on a bit of a, a PvP phase in Guild Wars 1 and I was I was okay at it I was okay at the casual formats which involved just small arenas which I wish Guild Wars 2 would, would bring back a random arena system in Guild Wars 2 would be fantastic but anyway 
Um, I, I, I was quite good at those formats, but I was never that good at some of the, the larger formats. Namely, there were two of them. There was GVG, which I never really got into, never really tried. But I've had conversations with people about it recently, and, and it sounds like it was a fantastic format. But the other one was the Hall of Heroes, um, or Heroes Ascent. It, for those of you who don't know, in Guild Wars 1, we basically had continuous automated tournaments, international tournaments that were running uh, through multiple maps all the time. So... Um, basically, the game would match make two teams against one one another, right? Uh, and you would be match made onto this map that was basically just a straight deathmatch map. Uh, and the law of the map, you were in the underworld, right? If you won this, you would go to the second map. And this was a totally different arena. I think it was still deathmatch. Um, but then there were more and more maps, and slowly you'd be matched against more and more people climbing the ladder, right, of this tournament. But as you climbed it, each rung of the ladder was a totally different map. And slowly it went from Annihilation game types to Capture the Flag and King of the Hill and all these crazy things because... Guild Wars 2, like, it had body blocking and stuff. There were all these amazing mechanics, basically. Uh, the, the, there was a problem with it, because the first map was always Annihilation, which favoured some teams, and then they just farm that instead of actually trying to get further in the ladder. But anyway... Uh, you'd go through, and there were tons of maps, so you have to understand this, there were at least 10 maps, if I remember, and different maps were added and taken away. For example, a long time ago in the past, there was one map where six teams all at once were on the same map. This was from a game where usually you'd just be with seven other people. So six teams, each of eight people, were here, right? It was this giant arena that was separated into three smaller sections. So you had three 1v1s going on at the same time, and the victors of those 1v1s would be let into this massive central area and then they'd all fight it out in the middle of there too there were these incredible maps right so six teams of eight people go in one comes out and then they progress to the next map and it continued on like this and there was a bit of a story there as well about how you traveled through the underworld and and suddenly you like you got quite deep into the mists and you found a place uh, called the hall of heroes right and it was this really cool looking place out in the clouds really mystical it looked nothing like anything else in guild wars one so it felt really special because this was architecture and, and assets and things you hadn't seen anywhere else necessarily uh, unless you'd done like one bonus mission later on uh, but you, you kind of go through this stuff and it looks fantastic. Uh, and then there were like three maps in this new kind of golden area. And the final map, okay, was a place called the Hall of Heroes. And I, I, be I believe for a while it was 3v3s on there. It might have always been 3v3s. I can't remember fully anymore. But uh, you'd go into the Hall of Heroes, and um, if you won in the Hall of Heroes, you'd be showered with re with rewards and stuff. O originally in the game, this meant that your server, like your region, got favor of the gods, and that would allow players in that region to then like access stuff in PVE. Later, the, the devs split it away from that because they didn't want PvP affecting PVE. But regardless, it was this really prestigious thing. If you won in the halls, uh, a message would be sent out to everyone in the game showing that your team had won there. And if you did win, You'd, you'd stay there then and other people progressing through these maps would eventually come to you and they would try to fight for your spot in the hall of heroes right fantastic so exciting you can imagine i'm trying to build it up um as i say i was i was okay at the the casual formats 4v4 arenas wasn't too good at the other ones wasn't really i was for a while but not really i wasn't in a guild that um, would play the really competitive stuff. So I found myself when I was in a bit of a PvP phase, desperately trying to get into a good, not a guild, just a team to put, to compete for the Hall of Heroes. I really wanted to do it. Uh, and this was suicide. You know, the game was already a little bit old at this point. Um, everybody knew what they were doing. To form a pickup group, a pug team, to try and go in, you weren't going to have much luck. Not so, barely any. So I used to just spend hours and hours, barely anyone would even form pugs, uh, desperately trying to get into these random teams and trying to have any success whatsoever. And I played on a Mesmer, which, in my opinion, Monk was the only class that was more complicated to play in Guild Wars 1. There was some crazy stuff that Monks had to do with weapon swapping and stuff and hiding their energy and all these cool things. But I was playing a Mesmer, which I always found... Mesmer was my favourite class in the first game. Incredible. It was nothing like what it's like in Guild Wars 2. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed in the, the Mesmer in Guild Wars 2, to be honest. But um, I, I was playing this, this reasonably complicated class, trying to get a team. Every team I got into, before all of this started, you had to do like a preliminary round where you had to fight just NPCs to prove that you could even be a part of the tournament. Like, so you just weren't a complete 
complete troll team or like on your own or whatever. Uh, and you know, half the teams I got into couldn't even get through that preliminary round. And also, if you finish the preliminary round really quickly, you would get like morale boosts, which would increase your health and energy. Uh, and so you could always tell roughly how good your team was depending on what level of morale boost you got at the start. And one of my, to go to the question, one of the greatest moments of Guild Wars 1 that I remember was finally getting a good team. We came out with like 10% morale, which was the highest you could, or at least it was 8%. Uh, and we just battered our way through all these teams. There were all these horrible, annoying teams in the early rounds that weren't really trying to do stuff. But we were built to be a balanced team. We had all the stuff for the capture of the flag. We had everything we needed. Uh, we got to the Hall of Heroes. I didn't even win in the Hall of the Heroes on that occasion. I, di I, I did hold it like maybe twice, three times in my entire history of playing Guild Wars 1. Uh, but I didn't even hold it. But the first time I got there, oh my god, guys, it was just... It was incredible, and then we just had this epic fight, and um, the, the Observer mode obviously existed in Guild Wars 1, and it was actually really good, and it would stream out these matches that were going on for people that wanted to watch. You just felt like you were the centre of the world, and these were the best of the best that you were fighting, and uh, we did okay, I think, but oh, wow. Yeah, the first time I ever got to the Hall of Heroes was incredible. Funnily enough, the, the first day I, I won it, I barely even remember. I just know that I did win it a few times with a team. I think eventually I did get into a PvP guild, but I didn't play with them that much. Uh, probably because I wasn't good enough or I had other stuff going on, but yeah, that was uh, one of my favourite memories from Guild Wars 1, and uh, I don't know, is it telling that I'm a little bit more enthusiastic about that than the Guild Wars 2 moment? I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, nostalgia clouds your vision. I think people forget that too often. Anyway, <laughs> next question, half an hour in. Uh, Yoav Tarazi says, have you ever tried WoW? If so, why Guild Wars 1 or 2 is better? I think, honestly, the main reason, the honest, when it really comes down to it, the main reason I was with the Guild Wars franchise and not the World of War Warcraft franchise was I was too young to have a bank account that I, you know, I could pay a subscription fee for uh, World of Warcraft when it, kept, you know, in the early days when both of they both released at around about the same time. And um, I don't come from a family that, well, they, they eventually started paying a subscription for my little brother, which I find weird. But uh, back then, you know, there was no no chance that a subscription fee for a game that I would get it paid for me or anything. So, uh, yeah, I kind of got into Guild Wars 1. Having said that, uh, I did play WoW. Um, one of my friends when I was at school and college actually uh, used to play it on and off. I think he got quite serious for a while around the B Burning Crusade days. Um, we used to go around his and he let me create a character and a couple of my other friends created characters too. I think, and I don't know anything about WoW lore or anything, and I hate to show my ignorance because I know I'm in a, a kind of a genre where everyone really knows. I think they're the Tauren, right? Uh one of the cow people anyway i'm gonna call them cow people because people call char cow people uh no i was playing uh one of those guys i don't know i got to like level 18 or something it felt like it took a really long time to get to that i don't know what it's like anymore i think you level really quickly but it felt like i played the game quite a bit uh i had no idea of the end game in it though i i had no concept of what it was like to be in a real guild and have a community there um it was exciting very much uh you know as most i think when you're younger mmos can be um Maybe even people were so excited. I don't know. See, I still get excited about games, but the magic of exploring a whole new world, it, it's not so strong for me anymore because, I don't know, I, I think a lot of walls were broken for me as I've gone through, especially like the Elder Scrolls series. I spent a lot of time modding, and I remember a distinct change in my excitement levels for games and universes and stuff before and after I started modding it, and I learned kind of how games are made, it, it shatters something there. I can still sustain my disbelief and, and so forth, but I think I have lost something from how excited I used to be about my first MMO and stuff as well, which I'll talk about later anyway. Uh, but yeah, so I have tried WoW. I don't really have anything against it. The main thing that put me onto Guild Wars 1 was that there was no sub fee. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Obviously, it, it got discontinued. Well, yeah, it, Guild Wars 1 got discontinued. Um, and I was excited about the second game uh, ever since from that. Funny enough, how I got into Guild Wars 1, because I don't think I'll be able to come back to this. It wasn't me that bought it. It was my old... I've got two brothers. It was my older brother that bought it. And... Um, yeah, he, he bought the account. Uh, he let me play, like, one character out of the original six, I think, that you got on on it. Uh, that was my Mesmer. And slowly as time went by, I just played it more and more and more and more. Uh, I think by the time Nightfall came out, I managed to convince him to buy the campaign with his money if I went to town and I was the one that bought it. And I said, don't worry, you'll be able to play it too, obviously. It's your money. Um, and he, he accepted that, but he never really played a character, not at the launch of Nightfall. I think, like, two years then, later than that, 
Uh, I managed to convince him to play again through Eye of the North and stuff, and he kind of made a new character. But he never... And then he got quite serious about the game for a while. Um, but then he stopped again, and then for a third time I managed to get him back into the game uh, in preparation for the sequel, which at the time I thought I'd still be playing with him. I thought, you know, he'd come into the guild I'm in and we could play it a lot. But um, he, unlike me, uh, he, he got quite a nice apprenticeship working with the government and stuff, and uh, real life gets in his way a lot more, and he he's never really considered playing the second game after that, and um, yeah, so he never stopped. Anyway, that's how I got into Guild Wars 1. Um, I think... If I didn't have, and now I now the thing is now I, I feel I'm very against subscription fees. I know, like the stats of what MMOs are like. I know that people don't have to charge subscription fees. I know that the microtransaction model is much stronger. Obviously, having a sub fee and micro microtransaction is even stronger. But you know, WoW's the only bastards that can get away with that. Uh, so now, on principle, I wouldn't play WoW because of its subscription fee. But originally, you know, when I was just like a more excitable teenager. If I if the money was there, I probably would have gone to WoW, and I wouldn't be sitting here. Probably, I really wouldn't, because you know the the space for WoW is very different. I might have never even occurred to me to do YouTube videos. So, uh, Spirit Wolf nine six three says, "What was the first game you ever played?" The first game I ever played, I don't know what the first game I ever played was. I wasn't old enough. I, I always kind of raise my eyebrows when people say, oh, this was the first game I ever played. Really? Do you know for sure what the first game you ever... Like, I, I guess it depends how old you were before you started playing games. But I definitely wasn't old enough to distinguish what came before other things. I can name a handful of the first games I ever played. And I have fleeting memories of some games that I know were the first ones I ever experienced. But um, I, I can tell you when. I think... Okay, so to, to list a couple, there's one game called Rodent's Revenge, which I used to play at my nan's house. Uh, it was on her PC. You basically played as... I think you played as a, a, a mouse. It was like a puzzle game on a grid. You played as a mouse. There were lots of blocks, and what you had to do was eat your way through these blocks to reach cheese that were in some of the squares. But as you ate through the blocks, the game would release cats that could move around and they would bounce off of the walls just like you. Uh, but you had to get to the cheese without being caught by the cats. And it was a bit of a puzzle game because you had to like break through the blocks. I remember being seriously addicted to that and I forgot it existed for a long time, but a couple of years ago, uh, my little brother was randomly playing it and I was like, holy shit, what is this called? And he was like, oh, it's Rodent's Re 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 Revenge. So I remember that. That was probably one of the earliest games. Um, I remember a, a fr uh, Friends of the Family's House. I played um, Ski Free. I think a lot of people played Ski Free. I was one of the people that never knew you could press F to speed up. Uh, so the monster always caught me, and I was sure there was a way to get past him, but I never could. And he used to terrify me as well. Oh my god, that Yeti thing chasing you. Uh, so it always makes me smile when I see like that image that floats around the internet where people are like, um, oh, I always thought the Yeti represented the... Um, the finality of death, you know, doom will come to us all. And then some other guy's like, you know, you can press F to get away from the Yeti. And then the person's like, oh, yeah, that, that always kind of gets to me. So they're ski free. Um, at that same house, they used to have, uh, I can't even remember what console it was. It must have been like a, a Sega maybe or something. Uh, but I remember playing one game. Okay, so one game I remember quite well was Golden Axe. I remember playing that a lot. I don't know whether that was the first. That's probably a little bit later. But there's another game as well um, that's called... that I had no idea what it was until really recently. I think it's called Toe Jam and Earl. And all I have is fleeting memories of this game. Like a, a, like a blobby character that you'd play. A weird kind of funk soundtrack in the background. Really abstract environments. It was a 2D side-scroller platforming game where you just had to get from A to B, as far as I remember. I think it was even two-player, maybe. Um, that's an early game that I remember. I remember a Mickey Mouse game that I used to play. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of games that I used to play that I can barely remember anymore, but I think the first game I ever got seriously into was, like, Sonic 1 uh, or Sonic 2. I think it was Sonic 2. What's the one with Chemical Plant Zone? Um, that one. I played that so much, guys, so much. I first played it when I was on holiday um, to the south of the country in a place called Torquay. Loved it. Incredible game. So those are some of my earlier games that I remember. I can't remember which came first. There's other ones as well. There was like a, a rescue game I used to play where you would play as this team of like rescue guys and you'd have to... It was like a top-down, cartoony-looking game, and you'd have to drive along with your fire trucks and stuff and put out fires or create, like, log bridges across lakes and things. And that seemed like a really complex game. There was another, like, learning game I played. 
where you're on this mountain, it was a maths game and you had to climb all the way up the mountain and you get like a trophy when you got to the top and it would go in your trophy room and you had to go up again and it would teach you about like division eventually and, and all this other stuff that I'm sure was insanely complicated to me back then. There was that. There was another learning game I played where, again, it was a really abstract thing, but I remember there was always this scene you kept coming to where there were these various doors and you'd have to pick which door you would go through. And I, I think I used to really struggle with that one. I never wanted to... I, it was obviously on a random chance, but I always believed there was some way to trick the doors and go through the right one to get the right questions or something. Again, that wasn't my nans, and I remember playing that. I remember playing uh, a Spider-Man game where uh, you like created scenes of Spider-Man comics, basically. Um, so you'd you'd grab like a sprite of Spider-Man doing a certain animation, and you'd click and drag him across a cityscape. And when you were happy with it, you would then play it back, and the game would like play Spider-Man swinging across the cityscape. And you could do really complicated stuff, and like, or it seemed complicated back then. Like you could give people dialogue boxes and stuff, and uh, make your own comics essentially. And then you could have scene transitions and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that as well. There's, there's a lot of games. I don't know. The thing is, I find it weird saying this stuff because if you didn't play that game, I'm just talking shit to you, basically. You have no idea. So hopefully one of those is you guys recognise. And you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. So anyway, um, those were some of my earliest games that I remember. Uh, and they're probably quite telling of my age, which I'm sure someone's about to ask me. Um, Mr. Raindrop 111 says, what's your job? Okay, so uh, to continue my little story from earlier... Um, I started doing the Guild Wars videos after I quit at the supermarket, uh, which I, I don't know whether I really regret that. I regret quitting it without having anything necessarily to go into, but I was quite depressed at that time because I didn't really have anything going on. I was just slowly living on the savings I wanted to travel with, but I didn't really have anyone to travel with. I think that was the main problem with it. Um, I, I, I didn't like the idea. You know, I'm, I still think I'm kind of young, um, and that it, it would still petrify me today, even if you gave me, you know, £30,000 to travel the world. If I had to do it alone, I'm not sure I'd really have the balls or the inclination to do it, even though it's something I really want to do before I die. Um, so I didn't really have any lead there, and... Uh, I'd been watching a lot of LPs before that anyway, a lot of Let's Plays, um, I don't know, maybe someone will ask me about that as well later, but, uh, and I started doing the Guild Wars stuff, um, and after Christmas, so I quit the supermarket in summer, and after Christmas, um, I built myself a totally new, uh, rig, I think uh, I w it was just as I was starting Factions, uh, I, I like had a break um, between Prophecies and Factions. I built myself a really nice new computer that I was very happy with, um, and I learned a lot about systems you know, on the hardware side, which is nothing really, uh, but I learned a lot for myself there, and that was a really interesting thing because um, since I'd left college, that was kind of one of the few things that I felt like I'd learned a real kind of skill, something that I could take into a job, and that even though I'm not really interested in, in, I was never that interested in IT, I had found myself now learning a lot about rendering with videos and upload speeds and, and a lot of, you know, networking stuff and now this hardware stuff too. I thought, look, I, I really don't know what I want to do still, but I do know that I can't sit about doing nothing for the rest of my life. Why don't I, uh, why, why don't I look to try and pursue something in IT? Um, which is what I did. So I really had no passion in it at all, uh, but I, I went for it. Um, I landed myself an IT apprenticeship, uh, which was kind of this intensive course. Um, they seem to do some shady stuff by the end, actually. Uh, but I, I got into that with a lot of other people that were kind of my age, which was nice. It was nice to be in a learning environment again, um, where I kind of, which really kind of blew my perception of, of systems out, out of the water. You think, I don't know, to a layman, you might think a lot of IT is kind of hardware oriented and learning how computers work and electronics, basically. It's not. A lot of what I was doing anyway was very much focused to get me a job in the IT industry, which is basically just, you know, help desk kind of stuff a lot of the time. Unless you start working yourself quite high and you become like system architects and stuff um, and I knew about those paths through like the IT industry uh, I learned a lot about this it was very much a Windows focused course I didn't learn much about other operating systems uh, I learned a lot about the command line though and troubleshooting stuff and uh, we did specific courses on XP which is obviously well on the way out we did um, a lot of stuff on Windows 7 as well uh, and then um, after that, there was kind of the opportunity to stick about and do a lot more exams and stuff on it, which uh, which I took that opportunity and I got them. I, so I've got some nice IT qualifications. Um, I, I left that apprenticeship. One of the things with the apprenticeship was they were assuring us that they would land us jobs out of it. Um, that might be a thing for all apprenticeships. I'm not 100% sure. But uh, I, um, I, I did manage to get a very good job actually coming out of that. 
and this was quite recently now when I finished that. I, I, I got quite a nice job. It was maybe about a year ago, actually, that this was going on. Um, it was in a different city, which is a pain in the ass because I can't drive. Uh, I was learning to drive recently. I'll talk about that later. Um, I, I, but I, I, it was a pain in the ass. It was in another city. I knew it was going to be a pain in the ass to get there. I wasn't aware of how much of a pain in the ass it was going to be to get there. But uh, it seemed really good because it was a very good company. I won't say exactly what it was. Um but they were offering me free university as well. Now, that university would have still been in IT or business. I could have had the, the, the decision. But I, I really wanted that. I, I really wanted to further my education. And this seemed like at least a way to get my foot in the door. And they would pay for it. One of the big reasons why I didn't go before was because, of course, uh, the, the prices went so high. So this seemed great to me. And... Um, I really, really wanted that job, did uh, interviews for it, uh, managed to land it with just a couple of other people, um, and kind of got a very early entrance into the, this company that most people were a fair bit older, you know, they were joining after they'd been to uni, they'd got their degrees and stuff, and yeah, they started on a higher wage packet, but I was very much set to uh, be earning more than them necessarily if I'd stuck about with the company that whole time and gone with the uni stuff. Uh, so I, I started working there. The the work was okay. I moved from uh, Windows over to Linux stuff, which was very much a, a push that I wanted to do. Kind of once my foot was in the door, uh, we spent a lot of time just kind of sitting around waiting for some kind of project-based work because the company worked that there were lots of small uh, projects going on within it that new people employed in would then go off and, and see who needed help doing this, that, or this. But because I was with a very small group of people that had just joined the company with essentially no qualifications that people wanted, um, not d degree-wise, it was very hard hard for us to land something. Um, eventually, though, I did manage to land something. So for a long time, I was kind of just tra commuting to this this place so far away with nothing really going on there, which was very annoying. Eventually, I did manage to get onto a kind of a Linux-based project, which was fantastic. I learned a lot about that operating system at the time, which now I, I've probably forgotten most of. <laughs> Now, two things happened at that point. First of all, I'd been getting really annoyed about just the, the commute in general, uh, but it seemed worth it because of the uni. The only reason really I went there was still, I wasn't on great money. The, the only reason I went there was because of this prospect of the university. Uh, and it turned out that I definitely wasn't getting it on this year, but we'd kind of in a, in a way been deceived a little. Definitely wasn't getting it that year, and there was only a slim chance I'd get it the year after. So that became a big pain. I wasn't really that interested in the work at all. And this was uh, really recently, guys. This was around July, maybe, of last year. So we're talking, what, nine months ago now? Something like that. So uh, this was really recently. Um, and that also was around when Guild Wars 2 was launching. That was after I'd already been doing all my, um, you know, Guild Wars 2 daily. And things were really on the up and up for the channel. Uh, and I kind of wanted to take advantage of that. It was really hard for me having like a one and a half hour to two hour commute if there are no train delays, which there were frequently. Uh, it, it was very difficult to have, even on a perfect day as far as the commutes were concerned, to still be able to produce uh, even one video, let alone two, which is what I've always wanted. I've wanted two videos over every 24 hours for the channel. For a while I wanted three videos every 24 hours, but hey, that's... Um, I don't think people have enough time to watch that much anymore. Uh, but I really wanted to do that, and very much I wanted to take advantage of, um, you know, things were going on the up and up. Uh, back then, I wanted to continue on with the Guild Wars 2 stuff, but also branch uh, out onto other stuff as well. So maybe eventually I could make this uh, a proper money maker. I'd just been partnered as well uh, around that time, so it actually started to see like seem like a realistic thing, and a thing that I really wanted to do, you know, instead of what I, I was currently commuting all this distance for. So all that kind of happened at the same time. I had a really good idea of how I wanted to branch out of Guild Wars 2, um, and I didn't, again, want to get stuck doing something that I wouldn't be interested in. Um, so I, I ended up quitting that job really early after I I'd joined it. In fact, I tweeted when I'd got the job, and people obviously took note. And then I, I tweeted when I quit, and I actually had quite a few messages of people saying, hey, didn't you just get that job? I was there for a while. It was quite a few months I was there, but, you know, according to most jobs, it wasn't. So I actually, I quit back then. And since that time, I haven't been employed again yet. Uh, as you can see, I didn't do too well branching out of Guild Wars 2. Um, Guild Wars 2 also didn't have a lot of the content in it that I I was hoping would help me sustain a YouTube channel out of. Some channels can do really well on Guild Wars 2. If they put out like a video 
you know, two videos a week, something, you know, if you're not putting out too many, but you're spending a lot of time on each one and making sure that they're really highly edited and they've got all of this work that's gone into them, I think you can do really well on Guild Wars 2, just Guild Wars 2, as far as YouTube's concerned, because lots of people are going to watch it, they all have the time for it, and you can make it really concise and really high quality, but I've always wanted to be someone that put out lots of frequent stuff, and I was doing every day of the week, just before launch and after launch, I was doing every single day of the week, three different topics each time questions that you guys were asking uh, I ran out of stuff to say very quickly you'll remember before Guild Wars 2 launch I have a video that I, a video I'm a bit embarrassed about now but I've got a video up called channel update and on that, I talk about all the stuff I wanted to do for Guild Wars 2 stuff. I think even then, it might have been four videos a day that I was kind of scheduled that I wanted to do. Uh, and they were stuff that, before the game came out, I thought would be fascinating, really good viewing. You know, uh, how to get all the points of interest here, how to get skill points. But actually, when the game came out, honest to God, a, a lot of that stuff just seemed like it would be mundane and boring. Who needs me to tell them where all the, how to get all the points of interest in Queensdale? Uh, and, and then Kessex Hills, and then freaking Gendarin Hills for every map on, on the game it's not it's not interesting and a lot of the achievements and titles as well people aren't interested in Guild Wars and ArenaNet are only just starting to fix that up so my ideas for doing videos on, on those as well just kind of went out the window so a lot of what Guild Wars 2 ended up being on the Guild Wars 2 front uh, I don't think anymore I needed to quit to do because um, th there's kind of a hard truth as well that even though my days were really long and really difficult while I had a, a full-time job and I was trying to produce two videos a day every day, which I was succeeding in doing, even though those were difficult days, uh, they were 100% filled. Now, I could produce, you know, now that I'm not working at the moment, I could produce five, six videos a day easily. People that are on YouTube and complain, oh no, it's too much, too much work, and they don't do anything on the side, I think are just lazy, honestly. I think um, you can hide a lot on this website behind how difficult something is. You know, you can refuse to do a very very basic little bit of editing because that's going to add so much to my you know my workflow it's going to take so long i i've never been someone that's found it particularly hard you know I, my the way the way that i work with putting out a lot of videos i do kind of keep it simple i i try to put out my commentary and then just stick it with some footage somewhere and go forward unless it's something special so anyway, um, th there's kind of a hard truth there in that even though I'm not working now and I could be putting way more effort into YouTube necessarily, um, I can't. A lot of the effort I have to put in now is planning ahead and thinking how do I want to do things in the future because um, people don't want to watch six videos a day that I could in theory put out. You know, there's a couple of you and I'm sure you might comment and say, oh yeah, I would, but people don't have the time. You know, I can't expect people to have, you know, as little of a real life as I have, if that makes sense. So yeah, I don't think that quitting necessarily was the best thing in the world right now anymore. Um, I did uh, a few months ago, I really want to get part-time work somewhere, at least part-time work. I think people are a lot more interesting and look like they've got a lot more going on if they are actually working part-time, even if it's in some dead-end thing like a supermarket like I was before. But at the same time, I don't have it in me to go back into like a sales environment or some of the other jobs I've worked before. Um, and I don't r fancy at all going into IT. A big part of it as well is a lot of what I've learned, I feel like it's gone out the window. So I could blag my way into a lot of IT jobs right now. I really could. But it, what, it scares me that a lot of people, you, there's a lot of people I've spoken to who are just like, it doesn't matter. If you've got the qualifications, just get in there. And then if they, they have to train you afterwards, then they'll train you. I, it puts me off though. I don't want to, you know, be like, oh, I've got this, 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 and this. And then they ask me something really basic um, that I knew before that now I don't. It worries me a little bit. So um, I would, I, like, there was a job going at a school that I thought could be quite interesting. And I'm still kind of looking for that. But yeah, so to all the questions, you know, what do I do as a, as a day job? At the moment, I don't really do anything. I got paid reasonably well at the last place I was at and before that. And I did save again. So right now, I'm living on a little bit that I get from YouTube. And I'm living on, on savings, which are, you know, very gradually depleting. The hope, obviously, there is that I can grow again. You know, if I can see the kind of growth I saw as Guild Wars 2 was coming out, um, you know, I, it would be very much my dream to do this uh, as a main thing for earning money. But um, even if I was growing that much, I don't think I'd stay unemployed for that long, honestly. I, th I think um, it's good to get out there and work as well. I would either do two things. If, if by some miracle, amazing stuff started happening on the YouTube front, um, you know, Guild Wars 2's population tripled, quadrupled, and all of a sudden I saw some kind of boost. I think I would I would either start working in what is otherwise a low-paid job, but something I'd be interested in doing, which at the moment I'm not too sure about, or I would 
as I say, I, I think I would definitely start looking into education again and I would really work at mathematics, the sciences uh, and get back to university and, and look for something that I really am quite passionate about on, on the academic side of things. So that's kind of my plan for what I'm doing there and that's what, what's happening with me. I do have a lot of plans in the future, but I think people will ask me that in a little bit. So we'll get to that when we get to it. But anyway, there you go. That's what, what I've done as jobs. Well, some of what I've done as jobs. There's been other things as well, but that's what I've done as jobs. Uh, and that's what I'm doing right now. So yeah, as much as I wish I could tell you that I'm a, a parachuting instructor, I'm not. Or a skydiving guy, whatever. Anyway, okay, uh, SNSD2Viz says, If Guild Wars never existed, what could you imagine yourself doing now? I've got no idea. You know, if Guild Wars 2 didn't exist, I would have spent a lot time less time playing it while I was at school and probably would have come to very different decisions, you know, even way back when I first chose to go to college. I, I don't have a clue. Would I be doing YouTube stuff? I, I don't know. The only reason I really kind of fell into YouTube originally was... I was bored one day. Okay, in the very start, I've deleted those videos now, and I hate that I deleted them, but I, it's because they used to have old music on them, and they were, you know, perfect stereotypes of just bad videos that people put out. But um, the very first videos I ever did was... The first one, I think, was... Um, I was bored with my guild in Guild Wars 1, or a friend particularly, and I wanted to do like an annotation based guide on how to do the char battle plan stuff um, in the char homelands. So I did a video that was completely done by annotations for the teaching aspect of it, because back then I was too nervous about my voice to get on there and do any kind of voice acting stuff on it. So I did this, this kind of crappy video, it was kind of fun. So one Halloween as well, I did like the costume brawl arena, and I put on a Lost Prophet song, I think it was Cobra. Kai I put on it uh, and it was just me running around looking at this beautiful scenery with, with lost profits going on in the background um, and then there was one other video I did as well which I was a little bit more proud of when I created a control scheme I can't remember what the program was anymore but I'd created a control sc scheme so that, that would let you play Guild Wars 1 on an Xbox controller uh, which I really quite liked. And that actually got some views too. But they've been deleted now on my channel. Uh, it then was like a year after that. Honestly, a year after that when I, I eventually decided to do my own LP of it. Um, so I don't know whether I'd be on YouTube doing stuff on YouTube. I don't think necessarily... I'm, I am I wouldn't say I'm a typical person to be on this website. Um, I don't know how many people really feel like they're you know a bit more shy than they come across in real life. I hear people say that all the time, particularly when they're LPing and stuff. They're like, "Oh, I'm really you know I'm really introverted in real life. I don't do that." But then they find themselves on the internet doing these videos, and everyone loves them and stuff. Uh, so I don't know how uncommon it is, but I I wouldn't knowing myself. I if if this was you know six years ago, knowing myself, if I'd said. If, if back when I was in school and my friend very first ever told me about YouTube and he was like, oh, I watched a funny video on YouTube and I was like, what the hell is that in art class? Um, if he'd then told me, oh, you know, you're, that would be a big part of your life at some point. I don't know. I, I wouldn't have believed it because I wouldn't have thought I was outgoing enough to do that kind of thing. But, you know, here I am. Hello, you can hear my voice. And that's just how things worked out. And Guild Wars led into this. And without Guild Wars, maybe I would have ended up playing WoW at some point. And I don't know. See, the thing is, because I I always procrastinated a lot of school anyway, so if I didn't find Guild Wars, then I might have found something else. I, I find it hard to believe that if ArenaNet never broke off from Blizzard or whatever, I would, I would be studying to be a surgeon or something. I, I can't say that. I would have just filled the gap with something else. Some sport that... Like, I used to be into a weird sport as well called Chookball. If any of you have ever heard of that, then um, yeah. That was one little hobby I did for a short while, uh, but again, stopped doing because of stuff like Guild Wars and games and other priorities. Anyway, next question. Um, this is a natural Guild Wars one. Sorry to those of you who haven't been hearing many. Uh, Creative Terror, four days ago, said, Speculate on where the story slash lore will go for expansions and even Guild Wars 3. You know, it, it, on the topic of Guild Wars 3, it seems such a crazy idea, but, you know, time can do so many weird things in 10 years maybe arena net will feel exhausted with guild wars 2 maybe they will have made some serious mess ups but maybe they'll still want the franchise to keep going and we'll see a guild wars 3 i i don't know whether we will i think if it ever got to the point where arena net had to drop because the only way guild wars 3 is going to happen is if guild wars 2 fails you have to understand this they're very unlikely to launch a guild wars 3 because that would just take away when they already have a successful mmo because that would just take away from their current one and uh, they're current one isn't necessarily a game that will age too quickly either because they have gone with this very stylistic approach 
So Guild Wars 3 would be a rare thing to see. I think it would be more likely we ever see a side story or something, you know, a spin-off game on another console. But I think the game has to be much more popular to see even that either. And obviously it wouldn't be titled Guild Wars 3. Uh, what would we see with Guild Wars 3? Or expansions even? Expansions are easier. Arena Net are going to keep with the dragons, aren't they? I'd like to say that... For me, very much, dragons don't excite me. They're not interesting villains. They're, they're, the motivations behind them, it's just not that good. And the debacle that was Zaitan and all that fight. Uh, I mentioned on a Reddit thread, actually, recently this, and, and somebody started trying to get down my throat about it. But I really don't think that the Zaitan fight was handled very well. Um, and regardless of whether you think it was handled well or not, I am no longer excited about fighting Elder Dragons. I was barely excited at first, and now I am no longer excited about fighting Elder Dragons. But does this mean most people are like that? Does this mean that most people are like that and ArenaNet understand that? Does that mean that ArenaNet understand that and would be willing to change? That's a lot of leaps before ArenaNet would change expansions to not be about the Elder Dragons. So what I'm saying is I think that the expansions will be about the Elder Dragons. I think ArenaNet might bundle some together. We might be able to fight two at once. I would love it if we could fight two at once because God forbid we have to go through four, possibly five, if there's six Elder Dragons, more expansions before we get into different interesting stuff. But but then, you know, give them the benefit of doubt. They might be able to add some of the more interesting lore along with the Elder Dragon fights in future expansions. And uh, I'll be more excited. The thing is with Guild Wars 2 is a large universe. Many games have large universes. And you can sum it up. You can sum up Guild Wars 2 as we fight Zaitan. We fight an Elder Dragon. But there is a lot more there. Um, and you have to appreciate that. So even if there is an expansion that comes where we fight Jormag as the ultimate goal. Because if you ask me, it looks like Jormag is going to be the next one. Even if they do that... I'm still gonna. Ha I'll, I'll still be playing it. The main goal won't be exciting me whatsoever, and fighting a million different types of ice brood things isn't going to excite me whatsoever. But there will be little things that appear. Um, I think it, the more inter there's more interesting questions for me. I I can never be sure about stuff in the future because I see all the different ways that it could go. I'm very curious about how they will incorporate future races into the game along with expansions. Like we know the Tengu are probably going to be a race. We know where the territory is. How does that tie into future dragons? What's this compelling reason for them to to, to fight the future dragons? I don't know. Uh, that kind of stuff interests me more. Obviously, we have the whole world as well. You can see out in the Order of Whispers base, you can get that uh, file by data mining, the, the uh, actual image. It's a huge world. It is a huge world. And I, I, how far away will we be able to explore interior eventually? I don't know. Because all of the, the Elder Dragons that we know of are so local to us right now. One thing that's very concerning is that factions, uh, Cantha may not be coming back, which sucks. And I'm really hoping that the thing is, I've got the lore videos coming up about factions, and I would love to be able to say that they're going to drum up loads of interest about the continent, and everyone's going to rally behind the idea of going back to, to Canther, and we'll change NCSoft's mind if it's all true, and then we will finally be able to go. But honestly, the game's getting old a bit. I, I'm really proud of the lore videos that are going to be coming on, on, on Canther and stuff, but I don't think they'll get that much reception, and I also don't think there are enough kind of hardcore fans of the first game that truly appreciate, appreciated Canther that are still about um, for it to ever, for NCSoft to change their mind or ArenaNet to change their mind on it. So um, I'm fairly sure that if it's all true what they're saying, we will never go to Camphor. I can't imagine um, our, our community being able to convince anyone of anything because there's too few of us that want to see that place, which is a shame. Like I say, I want to bring that to, ma to the masses. I want to show them how relevant Camphor could be and how much amazing stuff was there. But, you know, I don't think I'll get the penetration that the original videos did. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of my thought. very vague thoughts on expansions. I could talk forever, though. There's basically, where will the plot go? And there's so many threads that, you know, that's what most of my videos are about, basically. Fudge Monster asks, will you fart in my mouth? Sure, sure, why not? Why not? If you're into that kind of thing, live and let live, I say. Well, no, that's not living and let live, is it? I'm going out of my way to fart in your mouth. I'm sure uh, you'd enjoy that a lot. Anyway, right, okay, the next one is... Um, David Kurth, who says, will the awesome law, well, I was just talking about this, will the awesome, thank you, law series going to continue? If yes, then roughly when can we expect them? Okay, that's your first question. Uh, it should be two weeks to three weeks. I've been very loose with it. There are some fantastic guys that have been working on the law for the next part. There are three of them. They're really cool. Um, I had a lot of people approach me about doing art for the series. Uh, I have the first 
part completely scripted and written out. It may have some minor adjustments to it when I look at it. The thing is with me, I'll write the script and I'll be like, yeah, this is so cool. And then I'll read it again like a day later and I'll be like, no, that looks stupid. That's stupid. That's stupid. And then I'll look at it two days later and think that's stupid. But slowly as time goes by, I am eventually overall happy with it and I'm more proud of it. I find it kind of weird looking at my old lore videos and I hear some lines that I thought were so cool at the time but now I just think it sounds a bit cheesy like there was one line in Flameseeker where I was talking about um, the the rebirth of Prince Rurik and how it was like a play on the hearts of the, the Shining Blade and I thought that sounded really poetic but I'm not sure how other people took to it so anyway uh, the, the script is is pretty much final for part one. I have a really good framework done for part two, the script of part two, and I'm really excited about continuing with that. Part two, originally I looked at the overall story, all the main stuff I wanted to talk about, and I managed to split it into four videos. Um, part two, I predicted I'd get a lot further into the plot than I actually managed to once I'd hashed everything out with this rigid framework I've now got. So now part three is going to be longer and part four will uh, be longer as well, but yeah, there's going to be four parts. They, they're probably all going to be around half an hour long this time. Uh, really, really exciting. I quite like it. And a lot of art for part one now, which does have a full complete script, has been done. I'm going to be doing basically a pilot run with the guys, as long as they're interested, where I record kind of not a, a final version, but I record a version of the script. I'm going to edit it all together in a basic way and then um, show it to them. And then we're going to add and tweak stuff. The original Law series, I put a lot of pressure on people to get videos out and get the art in because I wanted to have the whole thing released before Guild Wars 2 launched. Um, when that didn't happen, now I feel like I should take my time with it and make these really good. One way I wanted to take my time with it and make them really good was I started learning After Effects a while ago, but I'm, I don't know very much about it right now. And in particular, I don't have much inspiration for how I can take the artist's work and improve it with After Effects. If you look at the teaser trailer that I did, I did like the candlelight effect and stuff, which was really fun. I would love to have the lore videos look a lot like ArenaNet's concept art stuff, where the, the art actually moves, but I'm no anime and I'm no artist myself so I don't know to what extent I can improve it and right now I'm a little bit lost for that so if there are any delays for the next lore part it's either going to be me pissing about with After Effects trying to make it look really good or it's going to be that when we do the pilot run we see loads of extra stuff we want to do overall the, the artists have been great and they've um done a lot of work in a short period of time and they're, they're not worried about you know picking up slack in some areas and stuff which is great so anyway two to three weeks for the first part and then the second part I, I don't know guys but it'll probably be a while I, I would give it at least two months for the part after the first part's done uh, but it's good uh, I'll tell you that much at least I, I really like it um, and I've learned a lot from before the old stuff that I've done and now the new things so for those of you that are still interested in the lore series it will continue in full force and I'm hoping to do it very extensively in the future, um, when there's less and even less Guild Wars 2 stuff to do videos on, uh, the lore series will always continue. It will always be something that you can see will go up on the channel as and when the videos are ready because it's really important to me to finish it because it's the work I'm most proud of. It's the work I've put most effort into, um, even though it's not my art that's on there, you know... The logistics of working all of it out, um, I'm really proud of what, what we've managed to accomplish with it and I'm not going to stop doing it whatsoever. So anyway... Yes, the law series will continue. David Kerr, David, sorry, Kurth also asks, in terms of PVE, what are your thoughts on the remake on on remake of AC and current trend of Cough One farming? Are they remaking Ascalon Catacombs? I, I don't have any idea, to be honest. Uh, I'm not that in tune with it. If they are remaking Ascalon Catacombs, and that's awesome, I think all of the dungeons needed a bit of a revamp. I can't understand why ArenaNet allowed res rushing to be a thing when the game launched. Why? It... it, it baffles me it boggles my mind they destroyed the integrity of the gameplay when they when they put those waypoints in and free waypoints until parties wipe like the 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 content is so vastly improved now and uh, now that the game's actually out and they've improved it this way but half the players don't even uh, accept or understand that all they see is a nerf and all they see is that now things are more difficult when in fact the content is way more engaging but it's too late. That, that that one change they've already made for the dungeons, I think it's too late. Because the exciting thing about those dungeons is getting to the next boss, getting to the next room. The first time you see that big boss, for example, in a RAR, um, a lot of people have seen already, and they would have died and res rushed and died and diluted all the experiences. And now that the gameplay's really good, it doesn't matter because it's all content we've seen anyway. Uh, so I can't understand, you know, they, they made a crazy decision. 
to have res rushing be a thing, but I kind of thought, okay, look, this is just the game that they want it to be. Maybe I'm not a part of Guild Wars 2's true demographic, which is something I think of a lot. And if so, fair enough. But then they changed it. Now, they, now they've now they changed it to the right thing, but it's too late, and that, that pains me to see. They also did... Uh, a lot of stuff, they, they talked a lot about how there were going to be big dungeon revamps and stuff, didn't they? Which, I don't know, I, I thought would be far more extensive than they have been. So far we haven't seen that much. Uh, we've seen small tweaks and improvements, small things. But, you know, it's it, it goes into what I was saying again. People have already seen the content. You can drastically change a lot of, for example, Path 1 of Koff. It doesn't matter. The, the players have already seen the areas. They still generally know what the rewards are like. And again, it's been diluted. It's too little too late. I, I think in terms of dungeons, Endgame in Guild Wars 2 was botched. But I also think people are a bit ignorant and thought the dungeons was all that was there. Um, and that could have driven some people away through their own ignorance. But nevertheless, um, it was a problem. So anyway... Uh, as for path one farming, uh, you know people will do what they what they want to do to get the most money. That's just a fact of of MMOs. People want to make their time the most efficient it can be, and that's just something that the devs will always have to struggle with, isn't it? You know they're going to have to slowly nerf these things. Uh, some people say, oh well, no, you shouldn't nerf it. You should just make the other options more lucrative. But the point is that if they're farming it so fast, uh, more money's going into the economy than Arena Net wanted originally. Then yeah, they do need to nerf it. Uh, but I don't know. I've I've engaged in. I haven't done that much farming in Guild Wars 2. I think I made some wise investments at Halloween, which has accounted for a lot of the money I've got in the game. Uh, but um, I did a little bit of cough path one farming when I wanted the. Uh tokens for my incinerator which was the original legendary i was going for and at the time you know it, it was fun to do and people were playing the game to have fun so there's always this question don't nerf it if it's fun but you know i'm not really there to make a comment either way uh you also ask in terms of pvp do you think that current improvements are enough or is it temporary and needs more love pvp frustrates me terribly i spent uh two months ago and i don't know the for uh, about a three month period i'd say Maybe ish, maybe two month period. I'm not sure. Felt like a lot longer. Anyway, um, PvP could be fantastic. It has the best fight to fight combat engagement levels, things to think about out of anything out there in terms of MMOs. Honestly, and I, I don't have too much of a base of comparison, but it's incredible. Really is conquest. Honestly, as, as skeptical about it as I was, doesn't hold it back that much. It could be brilliant. But Arena Net aren't putting the, the right damn things into the game. They had a really exciting system that they could have had laid out where uh, they would have had a system where they'd have like uh, an automated tournament that runs three times a day and then you'd get like qualifying points from it and then those could be spent on weekly tournaments and then people who were winning those could go into monthlies and you know they had a real structure that they could have gone through that was very exciting to me when I was playing PvP and it was constantly oh it will come later oh it will come later oh it will come later and they made a couple of changes recently where they basically added it started when they added that stupid um, paid tournaments 1v1s and just completely devalued all QPs and all paid tournament chests. They really ruined a lot of what the excitement in the game was for. Um, and they don't seem to be doing the proper kind of paid system or anything really exciting that they seem to have announced. Now they've gone with their new system, which I don't think is so good. Um, so the, it just depresses me. It really does PvP. I think ArenaNet didn't make the right decisions. I think it's too late as well. There's a lot of people who say, oh, esports just grow with time. And it, it's only a matter of time before Guild Wars 2 really picks up. I, I think it's too late. I think the only way PvP will get the community back, because it doesn't have a community right now. The reason why I'm not playing it is not just because it's less exciting, but because I couldn't find a good regular team. I desperately wanted to, but it wasn't happening. And everyone I was talking to also couldn't find a good regular team. The only really good team I was playing with ha had some right arseholes in it. And, you know, that, that brings it out of people in PvP, but... It just ruined it, basically. There wasn't much of a community. Some of the bigger teams that we were really excited about, we'd fight every now and then, and we really wanted to beat them. They end up quitting, and some people come back. It's just the excitement, the competition was gone. The people were gone, and that means more people will leave. The only way I can see PvP getting better is not by adding more maps, which is what ArenaNet seem to be doing. I do think that the success of Conquest is reliant on plenty of maps and plenty of good, rigid secondary mechanics, 
but I think that way more important right now is having the proper tournament systems in there, proper rewards, proper prestige for people to gain, you know, the real ranking systems. And right now it doesn't look like ArenaNet are, are putting the, the effort towards that. They have a very small PvP team. So you can't blame the devs that are working on PvP whatsoever. I, I think overall they've got a reasonable grasp on their own meta. But it is depressing as hell seeing that whenever a, an arena net dev logs in and says, Oh, I'm going to do a bit of PvP. They're kind of silently mocked by anyone that's been playing it themselves. Because they get thrashed by most of the teams of people that are spending some real time playing it. I think uh, they're making... Overall their balances are far smarter than they were in Guild Wars 1. The fact that they're going with incremental small changes over and over and over is very good. Just because you see a skill that's incredibly underpowered, can I just say, if you see a, a skill that's incredibly underpowered uh, and ArenaNet just tweak it slightly and make it slightly better, I don't think that necessarily makes it, is them saying, oh, this is fixed now. I don't think that. I think they're just making that small change to make sure it doesn't break anything, but it's slightly more valuable now. And then sometime in the future, they might make another small change based on, you know, how many people they hear screaming for it. And by doing this, they're not going to suddenly have these horrible swings and roundabouts here's what i believe with pvp and metas i believe that the meta and the team builds and everything that people are using shouldn't be determined by skill balance it shouldn't be because this week the devs have tweaked this skill to make it incredibly overpowered so we're all using this or this week the devs have nerfed this skill so everybody's using this i don't think metas should shift based on skill balance i think they should shift naturally and on their own that's a mark of a really healthy meta where it's all balanced. It can still be rock, paper, scissors. You can still have a dominant meta one month, but as long as naturally players can learn to do something that will counter that quite heavily, and then the third thing comes to counter it, and then the fourth thing perhaps, and then the original build's good again, if that naturally shifts around, that's the mark of a really healthy, good game, where new things are happening, but not based on just crazy skill balances and tweaks, and everybody's waiting on it. Because the more emphasis that goes on those tweaks to impact the meta, that's when people start really bitching and saying, oh, you you've nerfed my favourite skill, I hate you. you, you've done this wrong, and then they end up quitting for based on the wrong stuff, so... But Guild Wars 2 isn't there, is what I'm saying. I think that uh, because the, there aren't many PvP devs right now, I don't think they're necessarily focusing on the right stuff. Uh, I think that the game's just, the community for it is just going to go down and down and down and down until it's nothing. And I don't think it will slowly grow. There is one clause to that. I think the only way that PvP in Guild Wars 2 will grow is if they make Heart of the Mists free to play. And they can build a micro microtransaction system around PvP that will still net them tons of money. They can give people unique PvP skins and PvP unlocks for this and that and this. Whatever they want, you know, special finishers that you can buy in the gem store that are only available for like a week. And once that's gone, it's a permanent finisher that you unlock on your account. But once it's gone, that's it. You know, if they overhaul this stuff, the reward system in place right now in PvP is it's terrible. Fiddling about with the Mystic Forge and doing all the little salvaging. It's a simple system once you get used to it, but it's fiddly as heck. And the only redeeming quality of the fact it's fiddly as heck is if you're spending ages waiting for a tournament to pop, you've got plenty of stuff you can fuck about doing by salvaging things, basically. The reward system right now needs an overhaul, and I think if they make Heart of the Mists free to play, they'll get tons more people coming as a community, people that want to try it out, and they can still profit off of it massively. They just need to spend the time to overhaul the reward system to make that fit. That's how I think PvP, the, the only thing that will redeem PvP. That's my, and I am a layman, okay, and I talk like I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I really enjoyed my time in PvP. The core gameplay is fun, guys. It's it's crazy. When you see... Uh, like, I haven't played it for a while, but for example, when you saw that time warp go up and there's a Necro on the other team with Lich Form and you're desperately trying to strip the stability and knock them about and do... ah, oh, It's incredible, guys. It's incredible. Just the, the sudden heart-pounding moments that have been born out of some of the gameplay in it. Really cool. People also bitch about bunkers in PvP and say, oh, no, bunking isn't fun. I Actually, I really liked the bunkers dynamic it made it um a lot more a game where being stationary is a positive thing there was a much more interesting split and dynamic between quick players like thieves and elementalists and slow characters like guardians and necromancers you know having a bunker guardian on mid with your necro just off point ready to slam down aoe's and stuff you know there, there were interesting dynamics there which i enjoyed and i believe bunking is something that either the community or arena themselves aren't too uh, happy with right now and i can't really understand why coming from someone that did play a lot like a thousand tawny wins coming up on 
uh, by the time I finally stopped. Uh, I find it weird that there's so much hate towards bunkers, honestly. I also think, actually, while I'm still talking about it, I know I've been talking about it for a while, but another thing that's seriously destroying PvP is hot join. Um, the, the, the server browser stuff is terrible, it's so bad, it's not conquest, it's just deathmatch, and when you've been playing it for any period of time, you learn to not give two shits about the actual mechanics, everyone's just competing for points, because that's what it's there, it's there to grind glory. It's a real sad fact that some of the people at the highest levels and the highest glory ranks, you know, the earliest sharks we saw, they were all people that would just get in all day and just grind on hot join, which is mindless and boring and doesn't show how interesting a true 5v5 format can be. Why is it defaulting to 8v8? Why have we got 16 people rushing around like that? Why aren't there more incentives to keep people on points? I can understand why they don't just let people slowly tick up glory for standing on a point, because people will just AFK there and people will bot it and stuff. But I do think there are ways around that and I don't think enough time has been spent on improving hot join. Anybody that's interested in PvP in Guild Wars 2 right now, they log in, they go to hot join. That's the first thing they do. They play for a little bit. They're either really crap at it or they found a nice build for themselves because it's very much still build wars in many regards. They find a nice build and they do okay. They think they're amazing because they get like a couple of hundred points, but then they suddenly realize, oh, this is all boring. This is rubbish. And it doesn't show the true nature of conquest and how fun PvP is. It's terrible. I hate it. I, I can't stand hot join. Hate's too strong of a word. I don't like saying it, but uh, it, it's it's terrible. Hot join is getting people that their feet wet and then they think, oh, there's not really that much depth here and they leave. Because if hot join was really good, if it was more interesting, people would spend more time there and there would be a greater opportunity for finding real teams and getting into the more competitive stuff. They've been focusing on custom servers. I don't really think that will improve it either, to be honest. I think that's only going to help people who are already in teams and the problem is that people aren't banding together in teams right now. Um, but we'll see. I could be wrong on that. But hot join is needs vast improvements. I think it needs way more uh, ways to reward people and actually make the gameplay of Hot Join more like what we see in Tawny Play because that's what's fun. Um, and they're losing a massive amount of potential really decent PvP players in a thriving community because their entry content to the format is rubbish. It really is. Sorry if you enjoy your Hot Join. It's just you might not have played it that much. I, I can almost guarantee you, you wouldn't after a while. Anyway, Jesus, David Kurth has got me talking for quite a bit here. Um, uh, the next one is, what are your thoughts on New World versus World progression system? Yeah, I, I think it definitely needs it. It's depressing looking at the titles in World versus World right now. Um, uh, have they announced too much about what they're doing? I, I haven't really been keeping up it in that regard. Uh, but yes, I, I do think it needs far more progression. I think World vs. World could be far more complicated than it currently is as well. I would love to see more interesting dynamics with actually gathering supply, like helping out at the lumber mills. Uh, and I also think that um, when they remove the orb mechanic, yes, I can understand why they just wanted to quickly get rid of it. And yes, I understand that it wasn't functioning and that it was creating serious imbalances. But I do think that... ArenaNet at one point added the Altars of Power and Orbs into World vs. World. Why did they do that? They did that because they understood that the game type needed a little bit more depth to it. Just a little bit more complexity. Just another goal, another thing to go for. They understood that when they first added it in. And now it's been taken out and it's still not been replaced. That, I think, is a bit of a problem. We really needed that, you know, that extra mechanic, that extra thing going on. And I would say far more, too. Uh, I think that World vs. World is pretty fun for just running around um, on a thief, for example, and just giving people out and running off. But then I think that's a problem, too, that World vs. World favours certain classes in that way more than others. Um, and it's a shame. I would like to see it be expanded on quite significantly because I've never been too excited for World vs. World. You know, I, I spent a couple of days maybe in total where I really got into it and, and, you know, got like a tower or something and tried to build it up and try to... And, and, you know, that's fun, but it's also not very meaningful when just a Zerg runs along and destroys it after a couple of seconds. There's not enough permanence to World vs. World for me to feel like... Um, it's something I could spend all of my time on, which is a shame, uh, but, you know, it, all of this is a question of time. Guild Wars 2 launched with a lot of people um, playing it, but it hasn't... There's so much for ArenaNet to improve and stuff. I do think the game was a little bit rushed out. Uh, World vs. World would be right up my alley, very much the kind of thing that I would enjoy playing, but it needs a lot more there. Uh, the the new progression system, at least, I'll give them that. It's, uh, it's a definite start, and I think that will... It excites me at least to an extent, but it alone won't bring me back to World vs. World, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
Uh, lastly, you say, Ainet announced that they're not working on expansions at the moment. That means we will get another on the end of this year or early next year. What do you think? Uh, I, I, you know, I've mentioned so many times on the channel, oh, they've got half of them working on expansions, half of them doing live content, and now they're not, they did announce to us that they were doing expansions quite recently, just a couple of months ago, and now they're saying they're not at all. I don't know what's going on over there. I feel like the games earn a lot of money just from the microtransactions and the, the sheer sales it got and stuff. I, I would love to see... Here's the thing, right? For me as a layman, just player of the game, I can't comment too much on about what's going on there with their company because I don't know anything about game development and I don't know anything about any of the people that work there and they're just people that work there. But they do seem to be having trouble putting out a lot of the stuff that they wanted. Their original ideas with having half of them on expansions clearly isn't working. They don't have enough people working on the stuff they want. So people are being shifted around all the time, as it seems, uh, to just try and maintain whatever content they want to put out. And that seems like a bit of a shame. It's easy for me then to sit here and say, well, the game's earned a lot of money. Why don't they just invest that back into new hires? And then they'll have all the people. Where's all the money going? We, we don't know. And it would be very unfair for anyone to really say that, you know, they're not functioning as a a proper company you know when it's when you start talking about actual money and where it's going we have no idea what kind of publisher and soft is how much they're taking or just anything it's just ridiculous so i can't really comment on it i think it's a shame of course that they're not working on expansion already i've already mentioned on this video that i think that the guild was one model with you know it's okay to leave the game it's not a subscription fee game and we'll have an expansion it's okay bugger off don't worry just play it and then you can come back later and that's it you know when a new campaign comes out i really think that model would work very well for guild wars 2 but they've gone away from it uh of course i think it's a shame that there's no expansions i in another way though i like that they're still working on the theory we've got right now because there's still a lot of untapped potential in the current interior, which this could mean that they're working on. Obviously, having your cake and eating it too, having the company split both ways would be perfect, but, you know, if that's not feasible for them, it's not feasible for them, and you just got to leave it there and hope that they uh, eventually do put out a nice expansion for us once everything else is set and in place. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, right, that was David Kurth. Uh, I'm going to just go get some water, guys. I'll be back in a sec. I'm back. Hello, everybody. Hello. Uh, it took me ages to explore that little bit of audacity. Okay, so uh, the next person was X the Manimal, who said, WP, have you ever thought of making some kind of constructive criticism slash feedback video to post on the Guild Wars 2 forums for ArenaNet? I feel like if they realise how much you love and know about the lore of Guild Wars, that they take into consideration your feedback about improving the story, presentation, and PvE. Might be better to balance it with the good and bad so it doesn't look like you're just flaming or something. Um... I, no, no, I, I don't think I would ever really do a video like this. I don't think my opinions are any more valuable than anyone else that plays the game, and many of those people already give their constructive criticism and feedback. Um, so, no, I, 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 and neither do I think necessarily putting it in a, on a video would make it seem any more uh, relevant to them or make it the words carry much more weight. At least it shouldn't. If they favour people who just put out videos instead of text, the, that's there's a problem there because... Um, just because maybe I give it to them in a different format, it doesn't mean that I have any more warrant with what I'm having to say. You know, I, I, I like my position at the moment where some people appreciate some of my opinions and I can say it. And maybe I'll mention something that other people think, hang on, yeah, I do agree with that. Or hang on, hold on, I disagree with that. And that at least puts the thoughts out into, you know, at least a small section of the overall community. And maybe one of those people will then go off and bring that back to ArenaNet or somehow it influences people into an eventual critique or something that get, reaches their ears you know I, I like my position there I've got more of an opportunity to get some essence of what everybody believes back to them uh, just by having these discussions about stuff so no I, I, I don't think I would ever directly go and speak to them I, I think it, it would be a bit weird as well I think if you don't know me, if you don't know anyone that does this kind of thing, if you really don't know somebody who does something like this, but you see they have loads of followers, you automatically assume that they think they're the big I am and everything they're saying is gospel or whatever. And then, you know, they're really quite prying about what you say and whether they disagree with it, if that makes any sense. And I, I don't really want to give that impression off about myself. I don't think I know everything about the game and... Yeah, e even before I did Guild Wars videos, I would very rarely, sp you know, leave a, a complaint thread or something on the forums. You know, the the devs are quite in tune to the community anyway. And there was a guy on Guild Wars 2 Guru ages ago called Phoenix Tears. 
And he was really well known on the forums, uh, really no known because he had these very kind of controversial opinions about what he thought Guild Wars 2 should be. And he would be very loud and very vocal about them. And in fact, in a, a, a live streamed questions and answers, uh, one of the devs was like, yeah, I know this guy. Yeah, he's pretty cool. And you know, they always appreciated him for his largely controversial opinions. But he'd always be posting them. And essentially, he wanted Guild Wars 2 to be a very different game. And eventually, he, he just kind of faded away, I believe. Or he might have actually got banned from the forums. But anyway, what I'm saying is just because you have a controversial opinion i'm not saying you shouldn't post about it but what i am saying is um i don't think i can offer anything that other people aren't already offering and if i was offering something that was totally different totally out of the blue something totally interesting and unique or that would change arena Net's perspective if i there's no way i could offer that because if i did offer that it was it would just be something that i'm not interested in it would be me like saying oh you should make it 200 levels you should get rid of the flat leveling curve you should add five more professions every update you should do you know just crazy stuff that isn't in line with what the game wants to be so yeah, that's, that's what i'm saying i don't think i i would offer that much value especially not just because i do it in a video or because you know uh, some people listen to what i have to say so no i've, I've not really considered it but uh thank you for the congrats on the uh 1000 vids yeah it's been uh, quite a long time anyway uh noobinator 6000 says what lps are you planning on doing in the future um so i i should talk about my my plans for the channel going forward earlier i said that um i would really like like this channel to become a much bigger thing and to really go somewhere with it as guild wars 2 has become less popular i have become less popular i'm not seeing the growth i was seeing before that's totally fine you know i can really understand that uh, I, I always want to keep doing Guild Wars 2 stuff. I still play this game all the time. A little bit less maybe over the past like two weeks, but I, I still play this game quite a lot. I was doing my daily every day up until the past two weeks. At the very least, I'll, I'll say that. Because I think a lot of people just do the daily and say, oh, I'm still playing Guild Wars 2, but they're not really. Um, but uh, going forward, there's kind of two main things I'd like to do. You'll notice at the moment I'm doing Guild Wars 2 videos and two Let's Plays. And the two Let's Plays, if I put out non-Guild Wars 2 content, less people are interested in it. I don't really care, though. Uh, I think if you grit your teeth, eventually, pe you know, you'll just have a larger proportion of the people watching me will be interested in all kind of stuff I do. Um, what I'm planning to do, though, is right now those two LPs, one of them, uh, the Tomb Raider. When Tomb Raider ends, I bought myself... Uh, 10 months ago, a long time ago, just after the Kickstarter for it, I bought myself an Oculus Rift. Uh, that's a virtual uh, reality headset. It's kind of the first of its kind that's been at such a low value in the market, something that's actually affordable to your average consumer. Um, and every single reaction video I've seen of it from people demoing it at CES or what was the other one that they were at? Uh, anyone, anyone that's demoed it, there's tons of videos on it on YouTube. Um, it's looked incredible. They've always had amazing reactions to it. And it's something I've always been very, very interested in. So after the Kickstarter ended, I should have bought it when the Kickstarter was still going on, but after it ended, they did a very short period where you could pre-order these things. And I thought, no, I'm going to snag one. So I bought one. And um, I would love to do LPs of me playing uh, like horror games and stuff. One of the first games I'm going to play with it is going to be Doom 3. Uh, and I'll actually be in a real virtual reality headset. You'll see I'm a bit of a wuss, to be honest. I quite like horror games, but I'm a bit of a wuss. I'm back. Sorry, everyone. Sorry. Um, some like mechanics were just outside and like banging about. I didn't realize they were in the house. And then uh, I just like <laughs> accidentally shouted at them because I couldn't understand what was going on. Anyway. All right. So, um, yeah, no, the Oculus Rift. I'm really, really excited about it. I think if the technology can really pick up uh, and take off, um, then I will be so happy to have kind of been a part of it um the consumer version doesn't exist right now uh, i've basically bought kind of a prototype one that consumers aren't really supposed to be buying at all but i'm quite excited about it i think that it'll make some really good lps and um it's a nice way to actually start let's playing games that other people may have already done in abundance that i can now add something new and unique what i was talking about earlier with um having to do something different um like to succeed and stuff I, I really do stand by that especially with with youtube um and i haven't really like for my first ever lp i i like did the weird challenge thing as well as making it story focus i kept trying to do mini challenges whenever i did guild wars 1 stuff um and i wanted guild wars 2 originally my guild wars 2 lp i had all these grand ideas that never ended up panning out um but i i do think it's very important to do stuff differently and while i'm a big fan of many games that like AAA releases that come out and people just suddenly lp um, I, I usually shy, uh, shy away from it. I don't think that you're ever going to beat people or be bigger than people by doing exactly what they're doing. Uh, however, 
you know, I, I'm not saying like I would ever LP something like Amnesia just because it's so overdone. But, you know, a lot of horror games and stuff I think would be fantastic to, to see and show off in the Rift and add that kind of unique p perspective, which I would very much enjoy doing. So when Tomb Raider's done, Tomb Raider, which I concede, by the way, is just it's almost basically bandwagoning on a, a new release that's come out and everybody's LPing at the moment. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed Tomb Raider so much. I want to show it to you guys. I'll probably do quite long videos with that as well, just so that I can be done with that LP quite quickly. Uh, but as Tomb Raider ends, I should have my Oculus Rift. It's due to come like within a month or so. Uh, and when I have that, uh, I've got like a list of many different games that are going to be, or uh, the developers are either developing for the Rift or have already released games with Rift compa compatibility or third party drivers that add Rift functionality to games. Um, I've got a big list with all of them, basically everything that's known a Rift might work with. And there are some great, uh, great titles on there that I'm not sure I'd LP, but um, for example, so any basically any Source Engine game or Source 2 will work with Rift really well so I hear. Uh, I've played and really enjoyed Half-Life 2 so that could be uh, an idea. I also played and really enjoyed Black Mesa um, so that could be an idea too. These things work quite well with the Oculus Rift and I've also seen like extra mods for Black Mesa. Uh, Black Mesa is a remake of Half-Life 1 by the way in the Half-Life 2 engine. It's a fantastic game. The people that remade it though uh, left certain sections of original Half-Life out where they kind of just had to make cuts and I've started to uh, like one mod released recently uh, that called Surface Tension Uncut which restores one of the cut levels basically uh, back into Black Mesa. So through some some complicated mod trickery and stuff I could end up doing a really unique interesting playthrough of Black Mesa for example or uh, Half-Life 2's got all these really nice mods now that make it look super cinematic and stuff uh, which could also be very interesting. So I, I've got a lot of ideas. There's a, a very long list there. There are some games like Amnesia that are going to have compatibility. Skyrim, Mirror's Edge. You know, these are big titles that I think a lot of people might want to see. But I might still shy away from because, you know, there's been so many LPs of them. But could be fun. So anyway, Tomb Raider's going to end. And for what you'll see with just regular Let's Plays, that's kind of where my channel is going to be going. I think it'll be Oculus Rift based stuff. And hopefully very fun to watch. You know, actually see me poo myself for a little bit. Um, Guild Wars 2 stuff will always happen. I'll talk about Guild Wars 2 stuff I've got planned uh, in a minute. Um, but uh, the other thing is, when Grimrock ends, um, I talked about how I quit my old job um, for many reasons. I don't want to say this is the only reason because it sounds a bit pathetic and it wasn't the only reason. But one of the reasons I quit is because I wanted to focus more on YouTube. I wanted back then, all those months ago when the game came out, I wanted to be able to capitalize on the fact I was getting kind of a lot of traffic. You know, I was even mentioned on the TGS po uh, podcast at one point, which was awesome and very unexpected. You know, things were going really well then and I wanted to be able to take advantage of that and actually launch uh, a, a series on the side that would be variety gaming. So all of my successes wouldn't be pinned to one game. And that was the Daily Deal, which I look back on now. Uh, when, I, when I started doing the Daily Deal, um, I was very excited about it. I do think that the concept's got some real legs that it can run with. But uh, when I actually started doing it, I found it very difficult because... I was always bound to the whims of Steam. Like, whatever Steam picked would be the daily deal that day I was kind of stuck with. And either it was a really shitty, obscure game that I found very hard to critique, basically, or it was like a AAA game everyone else was already familiar with, and then they just have me bumbling about my first experience, that, and I don't add anything, and if anything, I just look like a moron, because I don't understand all the amazing things about this game, because I've only played it 20 minutes. I, I don't really think that first impression series that take themselves too seriously... Honestly, I, I don't think that they can do that amazingly, or at least they'll get a lot of kind of grumpy people saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I, I also think just generally on YouTube, if you take yourself really seriously and as admirable as it is, um, you, you can generate a lot of flack for yourself. There are always people that can hide behind anonymity and basically just be dicks about you and there can be this air of you know pretension that comes out of that so very much i i don't want to be kind of what i ended up being with guild was i don't, i'm i'm much more relaxed and casual and i joke and do stupid stuff in real life that i very rarely do on on youtube because i i i kind of feel like if you don't have anything worth saying just shut up a lot of the time so i'm always trying to say and inform and stuff on youtube so i've kind of worked my way into kind of one of those more serious people rather than you know other channels that 
are just having a lot of fun and are purely entertaining to watch, which is more what I wanted the Daily Deal to be. I didn't want it to be critiques. I didn't want it to be reviews. I didn't want to be someone that was pretending to know so much about games that I could give you a quick start, uh, little look at it and give you my impressions and then you could go away with some real information because I'm not that guy. I, I'm not good enough at it and I, I don't really want to fall into that niche. But whenever I did a Daily Deal video, I fell into that so much and this great idea I had about how I was going to branch out of Guild Wars 2 uh, crumbled at my feet. I and I hated doing the videos. I one I didn't hate. God, I keep saying hate this video, but I, I didn't enjoy doing the videos as much as I wanted to. Um, and the, my main key to get out of it, I thought, well, maybe I could make it dual commentary. If I make it dual commentary and it's a much more re relaxed look just between two friends that are having a look at a game, um, it could be much more what I really wanted it to be. But I couldn't really find a co-commentator for a long time. Um, not anyone that I thought would be a really good fit. Uh, so I, I, it just kind of fell to the wayside, sadly. I didn't want to keep pushing out the videos. It's, it's, it's ironic because I think if I did keep pushing out the videos by now, I would be so relaxed with it and I'd just be like, oh, okay, this this game, and it, you know, it might be a bit rubbish. but And I might be well known for it as well and it might have really gone somewhere by now if I'd continued. But the truth is I didn't. Um, so I want to reboot the Daily Deal. I don't know how excited... Some people said they really liked it. You know, it had a lot of uh, positivity behind it. But what it, I wanted it to be, it wasn't. And that's why I stopped doing it. But I want to bring it back. And I've actually found someone to do co-commentary with. Um, and... I, it seems very likely that it will happen. We've been spending quite a bit of time together recently. Just oh, It sounds like we're dating or something. But we've spent some time together playing different games and stuff. Um, and we're both really ambitious. So hopefully it will go quite well. Uh, and that's kind of my idea for non-Guild Wars 2 stuff with the channel. I would love the daily deal to come back. I know when it does come back, there's going to be good stuff coming out of it. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So I'm going to have Oculus Rift type stuff. Which if the Rift becomes massive, then I'm going to be in a great position. Because I'll have all this content on my channel of you know playing with the rift for people that eventually want to buy it which is going to put me in, a, in an awesome place if the rift does well uh, and also the daily deal which is going to be my uh, second kind of a, a reboot of it which um, I'm really kind of looking forward to we're working stuff out and that's going to be coming at the end of Grimrock uh, as for Guild Wars 2, which I'm sure many of you are way more interested in, uh, Guild Wars 2, I've still got a lot of plans of stuff to do. First of all, there's the Guild Wars 2 Let's Play. Uh, I view that that's going to be a very long-term slow burner thing that I'm just slowly going to keep doing. If I am really ran out of everything that I could possibly want to do for Guild Wars 2, then the, the LP kind of will come forward. But right now I'm looking at maybe once every two or three days, kind of a more highly edited Guild Wars 2 video now instead of loads of constant little ones. Just on certain topics, which I've known about for a long time, but... Um, I feel like still have some merit teaching people or various things that are actually kind of interesting to me at the moment. So right now I'm still I'm doing a lot of elementalist build stuff. I've still got at least three more builds I'd like to show you guys for the elementalist. Perhaps in the future as well, um, I'll be playing different classes and have different build videos for you guys. Um, so those I will continue with. I think they're quite important as well, I will say. I think that the Guild Wars 2 community has evolved into something that it wasn't when uh, before the game launched. I think before the game launched, there was a much bigger draw for people like me, who were already familiar with the franchise, just to talk about stuff to do with the game and just to teach many of the uninitiated. And I think there was a big necessity for that and you could be really successful for that when Guild Wars 2 first started but I think as time goes by as the entire community of Guild Wars 2 becomes more intelligent learns more about the game the kind of stuff that we're looking for on YouTube and I'm a player myself let's not forget this the kind of stuff people will find themselves looking for isn't so much you know abstract discussion pieces on you know where the game might go in terms of expansions necessarily or the merits of dynamic events and freaking you know scaling and stuff i don't think it's going to be so much about that anymore that, then it's going to be more actually real solid tips on how to play the game that people don't know already um, and impressive plays as well uh, one of the people i'm not subscribed to many guild wars 2 channels but one of the few I am is a guy called Strife, uh, and he puts out really high quality, good commentaries on very extremely skilled dungeon runs. Like one of them was killing the Arar boss, the the one the one that appears on all paths. I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not saying the name, but killing that guy in like um, two minutes, less than two minutes. You know, ridiculously low periods of time, or it could have been two minutes, twenty seconds, or something. Um, but you know, really fast runs through dungeons, impressive 
very cool gameplay. I think that's what's, particularly for me as a more experienced Guild Wars 2 player now, that's the stuff I'm more interested in. And build videos come into that as well. Showing off builds that allow people to play professions that they didn't understand this was a viable way before, that's cool as well. Um, so build videos I'd like to put out. In the truth though, the truth of it, I don't think I play Guild Wars 2 and I still play it a lot but I don't think I play it enough to be one of those channels. I don't have a guild that is full of serious enough players like that who, who literally do nothing else but just play the game and I really, you know, when I was experiencing PvP stuff I was, you know, rubbing shoulders with people that spent a lot of time in game and really, really pushed themselves to their limit and the guild with all my friends in that I, I spent most time with and, and kind of went into Guild Wars 2 with, they're not that kind of guild. And, you know, that's no fault of theirs or anything, and I wouldn't want them to change. But it does mean that a lot of that really high skill stuff where you have to play the same dungeon 50, 60 times over before you are this good and this impressive and you can show footage of it, I'm really, I'm not going to be in a position to produce that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm going to try and do what I can on that regard, but I think very much my speciality now is, is kind of set in stone. It's to do with the story. So I'm going to keep more on top of the story story and put out content to do with that. I've got some build videos I'd like to do. I'd also like to talk about how I play my Elementalist in Fractals because to me that's kind of really the only worthwhile end game stuff at the moment and every single fractal I have so many different skills that I end up using in each one. I, I could talk for ages about it but besides from that um I'm, I, I'm thinking of launching a series called Guild Wars 2 Mysteries, something like that. Uh, I'm subscribed to a guy called Yuri of Wind on YouTube, who does a series called Gaming Mysteries. Uh, and I really enjoy it. Basically, it's, it's a highly edited, um, post-commentated, obviously, look at various topics in any of gaming. You know, it's a very broad uh, channel. But he might talk about, you know, like a beta of a GameCube game. And he'll throw out some really interesting facts along with screenshots and footage for us. Uh, to see and I really like the premise of that series I think you could do something like that within Guild Wars 2 um, and I quite like the concept of talking about the mysteries of the universe that still have been unexplained to us. I put out a video recently where I talked about the facets. 99% uh, of, and that video was really well received, but 99% of everything I said in that video about the facets was already known before the game came out, really. It, it was all already known. The only thing, in truth, the only thing ArenaNet added when they launched Guild Wars 2 was put a little book in the Dermond Priory that didn't really add too much, but it was written in the cipher, and it was obviously a nod to something we saw in Guild Wars 1. They didn't expand on the story much. And that, when I got to see it in Guild Wars 2, when I first saw that book, it was very exciting to me to translate it, but then, you know, an hour or two after I'd finished translating it, I realised, hold on, they didn't really extend the plot at all here, and it was a bit disappointing to me. We still had this mystery, and the disappointing thing was it hadn't been resolved, and indeed, it, a lot of the mysteries like this don't look like they'll ever be resolved, because, you know, I think the deeper into the lore you get for Guild Wars, the more sceptical you can become about what the devs really care about for the lore themselves and how much is just throwaway stuff that was once in Guild Wars 1 but they didn't want to do anymore. If you think about it, they already dropped essentially the entire premise of their old universe. They changed much of the land masses, they added dragons and, you know, it's still Tyria but they added all these new races. For example, here's, um, I'm talking myself off topic but I will get back. Here's a good example. When they decided to do Guild Wars 2 and they decided they wanted five playable races, they didn't make those five playable races the races we were already accustomed to. They didn't say, okay, we're going to have the dwarves who already exist, we're going to have the Tengu who already exist, we're going to have the Charon humans who already exist, and we're going to have the centaurs who already exist. They didn't take five existing races that were already quite strong. They took two of them, two of the most iconic ones, and then they built a load of other races, three. The majority of them is all new lore. They, they made a big push they and then they basically introduce this whole new nemesis this whole I new idea of the elder dragons the majority of what we see in guild wars 2 is totally new i can understand why they did that they wanted people not to be alienated because they didn't understand the franchise before and so forth but it is telling of what a lot of these mysteries might end up in the dust you know just from those stats it could be you know two-fifths of them will actually mean something and the rest will mean nothing um and because of that for me, going into Guild Wars 2, when a lot of these mysteries went unanswered, it was a little bit disappointing to me. And it never occurred to me to do videos about them, because I'd already discussed them in one way or another in um, my ever-so-long Guild Wars 1 LP. 
But when I put out that recent one um, about the facets, because I found that tiny little extra thing that I thought might make it interesting, a lot of people were saying, oh, no, I had no idea about this at all. Uh, and that kind of makes me think, you know, I could do a whole series on a lot of these mysteries that will get people just as excited as I originally was excited. A lot of it will be drawing from Guild Wars 1 lore, um, but some of it will be Guild Wars 2 lore as well. Like, I've got written, I've got, like, basically written out in a little notepad file here. Some of, this was literally, like, the first 30 seconds I was thinking the other day when I was penning the series out. Um, I I could do stuff on the old benefactor of Zinn. I could do stuff on Garen Hoff, the Wizard's Tower. I could do stuff about the blue orb that we find and how it could potentially be tied to the Deep Sea Dragon. Of course, Mordremoth, this whole idea of the Sixth Dragon. I could talk a lot about this, the Pale Tree that... Um Shit, I can't remember his name. Uh, but as you're playing through the Silvari personal story, there's uh, another Silvari who comes from another pale tree, and the hints that there could be many pale trees. Um, I could do just one on the deep sea dragon full stop, or I might tie that into the the one with the blue orb. We could talk a lot about Malkor and Grenth and um, his father and so forth. Uh, we could talk about the gargoyles um, that just de decided to go missing, but for some reason are appearing at Halloween. Or uh, in Guild Wars 1, there's even really weird, obscure stuff. Like in the last couple of Winter's Days for Guild Wars 1, um, Winter's Days? No, it was Halloween, wasn't it? Uh, there was like a lich that appeared in Drocter's Forge, just a nameless weird lich that at the time ArenaNet said, oh, this is going to be relevant later. Well, how's it going to be relevant? How do we know? One of the greatest mysteries as well from Guild Wars 1 that still is unanswered is what happened to Avinia, one of the characters from the first game. A fantastic story. This really powerful, interesting character that just goes missing at some point. We never had a reply to that. We never had an answer. That would be amazing to see if we ever did, and I'd love to do a video about it. Um, there's Guild Wars 2 specific stuff as well, like uh, uh, the Order of Whispers one of the characters you meet seem to basically not be from any lands we currently know of. He's pretending to be Crichton, but he's not. The Wern Valesquez, I believe is how you say his name. Uh, and then, you know, there's classics like Baltech, the time-travelling guy uh, from Utopia, the Council Guild Wars uh, 1 campaign. You know, there's all this stuff. I could do a series on Guild Wars Mysteries too, um, which would very much interest me. So... Those are my general ideas, and then on top of all of that as well, once again, they're irre they'll be irregular, but they are constantly being produced, the lore series, you know, and I kind of look at those as the crown jewel, the, as I say, the thing I'm most proud that I've ever done. Um, so yeah, uh, then you've got the lore series going on, so you know, that's a good three or four different concepts, different st things that I'd like to continue producing Guild Wars 1 end, until eventually we get new content, um, in, in a large way of expansions or hints at new content. You know, I can continue giving sums up of the living story as it goes forward. One thing I don't want to do is fall into what I fell into at launch, uh, which is news. I don't want to be the guy that talks about one stupid thing that's just been added to the Black Lion store, and I'll talk about it for a minute or two, and then I'll say, oh, that's good enough, and then everybody just, like, sheeps goes and watches it, when they could easily just read it out of the update notes. I don't want to be that guy. I fell into that a little bit, I, 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 and I'm not passionate about that. I want to make videos that I would watch myself right? That's, that's always been important to me. And I wouldn't watch videos about skill updates and just stupid little crap that, you know, can be done um, because I, I, I would read it for myself. You don't need me to read stuff out loud. I, I'm not here to narrate your life. Though, you know, if somebody paid enough, I probably would narrate someone's life. So I, <laughs> I, I don't want to fall into that trap. You know, I, I started doing Guild Wars 1 videos because I wanted to teach about stuff people didn't know. That's harder now. You know, people are smart. They picked up the game. It's been a long time since launch. Um, and I can't preach to those few people that don't know much anymore. Because, you know, a lot of people know more than me now. And that's totally fine. And I accept that. Some people like Guild Wars 2 more than me. People play Guild Wars 2 more than me. You know, I still very much enjoy the game. I've never stopped playing the game. Even when I was when I stopped doing videos, I was always playing the game. And I'm, all, I'm still very passionate about the game. But I can't... I don't feel right giving information that wouldn't interest me anyway in the first place right if that makes sense so you know that that makes it a little bit harder to do videos and a uh, part of the reason why i stopped doing videos over christmas um came down to that too you know i i, I felt like every little concept i had I, I wasn't worthy kind of thing i needed something good to come out with um when i i i know maybe i'm a little bit too hard on myself with that a lot of stuff people will be interested to hear anyway but i want to keep it you know interesting stuff anyway and i've just realized i keep touching the mic so anyway, those are my plans you asked what do i plan to lp in the future uh those are my plans for kind of all videos in the future you know if the oculus rift takes off if the daily deal takes off which i very much believe both will um then that should help me a lot 
uh, alongside Guild Wars 2 stuff and hopefully uh, put me in a position where I, uh, you know, I can finance uh, my re-education. Re-education, that makes it sound like I, I never went to school or something. But, you know, you know, finance real life stuff going forward. Everything I think about with my future, it's, it's funny. It ties back to this, you know. It's like, oh, if I just found real success on YouTube, everything would be amazing afterwards, you know. Uh, but it's not that simple, is it? Otherwise, everyone would be doing it. Um, Very Cold Milk asks, do you think Guild Wars 2 gets boring? I think it can get boring if uh, if you don't have the investment to your character, if you don't really care about the character you're playing, if you, the profession you're playing never really clicked with you, and neither did you ever try any other professions. Yeah, I think you can get bored by the game. If you don't have a community, if you don't have friends, if you don't have people uh, in-game, I mean, then yeah, it can get boring, you know. Tyria can be a cold and lonely place when you're just levelling on your own. I can totally understand the game getting boring. I myself am not so interested in a lot of the things I originally once was. I was really keen on getting the incinerator for a while. I've had enough money to have a legendary for a long time now. Um, because of stuff that I bought at Halloween. Uh, but I, I, I've not done it because it's not too much of a goal for me. I don't think the rewards really grab me in Guild Wars 2. Um, and I don't think we should all be playing for rewards anyway, but... You know, every game has a threshold of content, right? And you can run out of content. People are so stupid, right? When they say, oh, I was told this game was not going to have any grind. I was told Guild Wars 2 was not going to have any grind. Everything will have grind if you finished it. If you finished all of the content that's there, the only way to extend it is by is through grind, okay? So get used to it, right? You're always going to have to ask yourself a question. Am I done, right? The whole point with Guild Wars 2 is there's no mandatory grind. And that was exactly the same for Guild Wars 1 as well. No mandatory grind. Of course there's going to be grind for the high-end stuff. The point of saying there's no grind isn't that they're going to be all wonderful developers that just give you everything really easily straight away. And there's not going to be anything that takes a long time to work for. If they did that, there'd be even less of a community in the game. And it would be even more boring because there'd be nothing to go for. Anyway, I know that's not what you're saying, very cold milk. Uh, but yes, I, I do. If you're asking specifically if I've ever been bored with Guild Wars 2, yeah, you know, even uh, if I'm perfectly honest, at the moment, I'm a little bit bored with it. I'm just kind of waiting on living story stuff uh, for now. Uh, as I say, with a legendary, I almost bought Kratkin like a month ago or something. I was like, oh, why don't I just spend it? Kratkin's cheap. And then I can fill in that little tab on my character select screen. But I got as far as buying the rare mats and thought, no, I don't want to spend all this money on it. So I left it. Um... But yeah, no, it, it can be boring. It can. Uh, there's only so many uh, characters you can level up over and over and over again before it will get boring. Anything does. If if you can stick with the same... I, I know some people are mono gamers, but if you could stick with the same game for the rest of your life, then you're quite a special person. I think everyone will get bored eventually. Um, and that's kind of what ArenaNet's live team is there to stop from happening. Anyway, uh, Symphokin, Symphonicia says, uh, would you rather fight 100 quaggan-sized Zaitans or one Zaitan-sized quaggan? Um, and this got a lot of thumbs. I think somebody else asked me the actual uh, Reddit one as well with the ducks and horses. I don't know. Um, 100 quaggan-sized Zaitans, probably, because we barely see Zaitan, and it's always just in canned animations and stuff in certain areas. So, yeah, let's go. Let's get actual mini Zaitans running around. That'd be awesome, because we'd actually get to see him instead of just press 2 and kill him. So, yeah. A Zaitan-sized quaggan would be much easier for the devs to implement, I'm sure. But I'm not going to make it easy. Um, fire furnace asks do you like game of thrones oh my god you know i was gonna film this video yesterday uh but i started watching game of thrones again and i just marathoned the first two seasons because it's coming back at the end of the month yes i very much like game of thrones i'm very much looking forward to the next season of it uh and whenever george rr R. martin writes more books and so forth as many other people are complaining about uh also am i a brony no i'm not a brony uh a while ago somebody did like quite a while ago somebody put some kind of like my little pony reference into a, a question that i uh answered on guild Wars 2 daily and just all the comments were like oh wooden potatoes isn't a brony i do you know what though i think um I am the kind of person that can watch shows like that and, you know, like kid shows and stuff, like Cartoon Network stuff, uh, even, you know, as an adult and just watch it for hours and hours and waste a day away laughing at the stupid little jokes. I can totally do that. So I think if I ever gave it the time of day, I probably would find something redeeming in My Little Pony. Uh, but I've never really been into it. The most I've ever experienced with bronies was the weirdest video I saw on YouTube where it was this guy. Um, I don't know whether it was serious. You know, some people like... You see some videos that seem like they're troll videos. Uh, the, uh, it's just people saying ridiculous stuff, but they, they do it really seriously. It was this guy uh, that was talking about My Little Pony and how he was really 
influenced by it that animation from his childhood had begun to wear him out and you know over the past decade we hadn't seen anything really good and nothing like hey arnold or whatever and then he he watched my little pony and he really enjoyed it and all of the themes were tasteful and this 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 and this uh, and how it kind of really inspired him to get into animation and stuff Uh, and he got like really he was going on this monologue it was fascinating to watch him i don't know whether he was joking or what but he got like really into it and started shouting and like crying at some point it's a new oh my god so yeah uh that's kind of my closest experience with what i assume real brodies are but yeah that was an interesting video what's my favorite book series I don't read as much as I should. Um, I'm a bit of a stereotype in that I've only read really popular book series. Uh, I I get really into stuff. Like when I got into Harry Potter and I read those, the, can I just say the books are way better than the films. Like I can't stand the films. I really can't. Not because they step all over the books and they don't include all of the information and stuff. Not because I'm elitist or snobbish about that. Just because I, I, I don't really like the, the, the acting in them or just the general way they're produced they're not really dark enough for me uh not as dark as the books can come across anyway um but yeah i really enjoyed the books and i get really into stuff so when i last started reading them i read them for ages and ages and ages and uh when it finally ended because they i basically harry potter and his friends and hogwarts just consumed my entire being and my life and then when they finally ended it's like it's literally like you've just lost your best friends kind of thing you know and i I was like legitimately kind of depressed like oh they're gone oh there's nothing else to read and it's weird you know i whenever i read i read so much i start thinking like a narrator and it's very odd it's like oh i did this cautiously or whatever really weird uh that's either because i don't read enough and then i suddenly just read way too much and my head's like whoa what are you doing this is not normal media for me or what but anyway um so because i don't read that much i suppose i would have to put harry potter quite high i did read a, a series of books called like sabriel lyriel abhorson i think there was a fourth one that came out at some point as well which quite stuck with me but then i was a young teen at the time and uh, i don't think that they're necessarily that good anymore um, I'm sure if I went back to them, I wouldn't enjoy them that much. One series I've really wanted to get into is the Wheel of Time series. I have some friends, uh, like real life friends, that really swear by it. But it's like there's so much stuff I want to do, but I, I I don't do it. I don't give myself the time to enjoy it. So yeah. Anyway, that's just a few. Uh, what's your favorite game? What's my favorite game? Well, that's an easy question to ask and a hard one to answer. In terms of of hours, it would have to be Guild Wars. That's what I've spent most of my time playing. Um, it changes though as as time goes by. I hate to just pick. As I say, it's like if you pick a favorite, it kind of um, it does no justice to everything else that you've ever enjoyed. Uh, but I do think so. My favorite changes as time goes by. I think right now the most powerful game that I played recently was The Walking Dead. Loved it. Would recommend it to everyone. Someone else here has asked, "Hey, what game would you recommend?" The Walking Dead player, it's, you know, I, I, I'm a bit of a sucker for decent story, well-executed story. That game made me cry twice. Uh, it's such a good game. It really is. And I know that's not very masculine, but oh my God, such a good game. Um, so right now I'd have to say that. But, you know, I've enjoyed many games, played many games. Uh, but that's the one I'll point out if you're looking for a recommendation for something to play. It's not that expensive either, I don't think. Will you do at least one episode with a face cam? What I was saying about the Oculus Rift, I that would probably go quite well with face cams. But again, it's like I say, I don't really want to show myself too frequently or too often. Um, one thing that I think might be quite interesting to do at some point today is like put myself up in a lineup with just like as many different looking men as I possibly can. And then I'll take a picture of it and then put, upload it and say, I am one of these people uh, and just leave it at that. I think that'd be amazing. Ah, uh, that would be pretty good. But um, yeah. Uh, the next question is: Are you gay? No, but some people. Are, I've had quite a few questions of this. Uh, apparently, I sound quite gay sometimes. Uh, no, I'm not gay. I have nothing against gays. I've got a very good gay friend actually. Um, and yeah, I don't really have many opinions. But no, I myself, I'm, I'm not gay. Sorry to disappoint anyone that's uh, that's been like basically saying I love your voice or homo intended. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Uh, do you have a mate, love heart? Do you mean like a, a girlfriend? Lots of people ask me if I've got a girlfriend. I'm also single at the moment. Oh, I could get into some heavy conversations there, but I don't know. Maybe we'll do it later. Uh, what have you done on your channel that you regret? Um, that's it. Oh, what have I done on my channel that I regret? That video I was talking about earlier where I said, oh, this is all the stuff that I want to do, um, and then never did it. I regret that very much. Um, there's some stuff that I, 
I, I regret not having done certain things. To an extent, I regret having not shown myself or, or given my name and stuff because now people will have stuff built up in their own heads of their perception of me that I'm, that's going to, you know, be different to the reality. And, I, you know, delaying that and delaying that and delaying that has just been going on for a long time. So in a way, I kind of regret that. I also did, it's not necessarily on the channel, but um, when things were going really well just as Guild Wars 2 launched, I did an interview uh, I think it was Guild Wars Insider, I did an interview with someone where I talked at length about how consistent you have to be with videos and if you really want to do well on this website you just have to have consistency because I don't offer anything really special but I've always been consistent, I've always seen projects through, I've done everything and, and I've always tried to upload at least one video a day and so forth uh, and at the time of that interview that was all very true but no sooner as I put it out, I, you know, I've had that kind of hiatus over Christmas now I haven't finished my Uncharted LP Guild Wars 2 LP is not finished and it's not really scheduled to be finished for a long time either and I kind of destroyed that integrity there, I think, you know, people lose their trust very quickly, I still get comments of, of people saying, oh, you didn't finish Uncharted and, you know, that really kind of ruins it and I look back at that interview as well and I regret saying what I said there because you know I, I kind of put myself on this pedestal as this paragon that could do all these virtues I was talking about that even make any sense and then uh and then I, I I kind of bugged it up and didn't do it so I've that kind of makes me cringe look, looking back on that interview to be honest because I, <laughs> I I didn't stick by it so I kind of regret that there's other decisions I made where you know Maybe I'd be doing better now if um, if I'd always been asking for likes and subscriptions and stuff and favourites like most people do. But I've never done that, uh, and I don't know. I don't know whether I can say I regret not doing that. To be honest, because um, yes, I've probably grown a lot slower than I otherwise could have. But I also like that I kind of have that little bit of integrity. I very much believe that. Um, if I find success, I want it to be because I put out good content rather than because I knew how to tag my videos or I did a bunch of collabs with the right people or I hoard myself out for 10, 15 seconds at the end of every single video and I came up with you know little catchphrases and stuff that people would always come by and you know 99% of what everyone does on this website does that and that's fine to them and you know I I don't really resent it that much when I watch people doing that to the people I'm subscribed to but I do like now that I have have that fact about me and that and I don't want to ruin that and maybe I <laughs> I don't know whether I regret it to be honest because if I was the kind of person that could just say no fuck it I'll just do it on every video now and you know reap the rewards because I really want to do well um, but I'm not that person I, 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 I'm, I will probably never ask for that stuff but this could be another example like that interview where I say right now I'll never ask for it and then in a year's time I'm whoring myself out all the time and then I'll look back and shudder so I don't know but I don't know whether I regret that I've taken that stance, but I have taken it, and now I, I kind of want to stick with it, because that's what I do, I kind of just stick with stuff. Anyway, thanks, good questions. What has been your favourite game again, besides Guild Wars and Tomb Raider? Well, I kind of already answered that. Tomb Raider has always been a, a series, though, that stuck with me for a long time. Those were the some of the first games I really got very into and spent a lot of time playing, so they, they'll always have a special place for me, particularly the classic Tomb Raiders. What's your slash age in Guild Wars 2? How many achievement points do you have? Well, I'll have to actually load it up. Give me one second to do so. Um, my slash age in Guild Wars 2 is 1,370 hours, and my achievement points are 5,747. Somebody else later, I think, will also also asked about um, my hours in Guild Wars 1, and I think that's 6,000, maybe coming up on 7,000. I had multiple accounts in Guild Wars 1. So they combined, yes, it's a disgusting amount of hours. If I'd spent all of that time playing the guitar, I would be a great guitarist or something. But no, I spent it having fun. I don't know how much I should regret that. I mentioned on my very last episode of... Uh, my original Guild Wars 1 LP, I talked about how many hours I'd spent in Guild Wars 1 and how much of my life essentially I'd wasted away. Uh, and I also talked about how, in a weird way, it's not been wasted because from all of that time, all of that experience, all of that knowledge, I had put all of it into the original Let's Play. All of it. And now there's this thing on the internet for at least as long as YouTube's here. Um, and probably it will always be on a backup somewhere. Um, there's kind of this thing that's just immortalised that, and all that information I talked about way back at the start of this questions and answers that I may have forgotten about before, that's there now, you know, and I I'm kind of proud of that, so at least something productive came of it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of hours, isn't it? It really is, and uh, I don't know how many more I'll end up with Guild Wars 2, but probably quite a few. 
somebody asked me as well like or i saw someone said had a comment that was like um oh i'm shocked at how many hours you'd had just after guild wars 2 launched like uh i can't believe that someone would manage to play the game that much well that really ties into you know guild wars 2 launch just as i'd quit my job as well so i had all of that time to play um the hours haven't been racking up so fast uh, recently though no not at all uh the next per- the next person to ask a question was the flying piranha uh your favorite childhood sweet or chocolate uk based of course Oh god, um, there was this weird chocolate that uh, one of my mum's boyfriends once brought back and like it, he basically lifted it off of a truck as far as I'm aware. It was this kind of, uh, I'm not sure it was UK based, but it was delicious. It was like this dark chocolate that was done in a really weird way and we had all these packets of it and it was amazing. Um, I'm not too much of a chocolate guy, to be honest, I don't eat that much. There were also one that sticks out, not necessarily my favourite, but for a while there were these things called like Willy Wonkers. That had like all of this, um, like they would, they were like fizzy chocolate bars, and that sounds disgusting. I see a lot of American recipes and stuff on cooking channels and things where they're like, "Oh, I'm just gonna make a Coke cake," or all this weird. Stuff. That sounds really weird. Uh, but no, there was like, um, I, if you're from the UK, you'll know. But you'd bite into it and it would like start snapping and crackling around in your mouth. There's a lot of stuff. Dime bars I used to love as well. Dime bars, they were they were pretty good. And they were cheap as well, so you could get them all over the place. Your favourite place to visit, go on holiday? Um, I've never been, as far as going abroad, I've never been abroad to the same place twice. So I don't know whether I can really say I have a favourite. But uh, I did go to Dubai once with my uncle. And he gave me like the, this most amazing holiday. Like We went to all these really kind of classy hotels and stuff. And had these really nice buffets. And ah, oh, it was amazing. I saw like the Burj shit what's it called the like the seven star hotel that was a pretty great holiday i went on holiday with my friends as well um while i was in college and uh we went to tenerife at that point and that was fantastic really cool uh i remember that quite a lot i haven't been to uh, on holiday recently though at all and i miss going on holiday abroad at least when i was little i used to go to uh that place i talked about earlier where i played um shit what did i say i used to play uh echo the dolphin there oh sonic yeah uh, and echo the dolphin that place i used to go to quite a lot that was in torquay uh, in england which i always have kind of happy memories from uh, your area of expertise, college, university subject. Uh, I don't know. Well, I guess media and film was the majority of what I did back then. Uh, but I was always best at English language. That always interested me a lot more by the end. Uh, I just didn't see it putting me in a job or anything. Or maybe IT now because I've got all that extra information there. Your inspiration behind the name Wooden Potatoes. I wish, I wish there was a good story for this, guys. Uh, basically, I had an old friend who once made, a, like, uh, he made his MSN account, um, and he, he didn't know what to name it, right? So we were quite young at the time. He didn't know what to name his email, so he just picked a random item in the room and, like, added another random word to it, and that was it. Uh, and then, like, ages later, when I originally made my YouTube account in, like, 2008, Four year, five years ago now, when I made my uh, YouTube account back then, um, I had no idea what I wanted to call it, and I just thought randomly back to that. I don't know how, you know, it had been years before even that when that happened. Um, but I just thought back to that, and I thought, okay, what are two random things? And those were the random things that came to me. I wish there was a better story. I've tried to make up stuff about how, you know, like, a potato is a root vegetable, and roots, trees have roots, and then in a weird way that makes it wood. I don't know, but there's nothing, honestly. That's the inspiration. That's another reason why I say I kind of think my pseudonym is a bit rubbish. Uh, there's not too much by it. Someone will also mention, um, I have an alternate channel as well called Concrete Ducks, which I put stuff out on ages ago, and I've always wanted to do stuff on, but it's just an empty dead channel, so I wouldn't bother going to look at it. But I named that after Wooden Potatoes because I thought it was in the same vein, and again, it was just the two first random things I thought of. Um, so yeah, sorry guys, there's not much of a interesting story there, but I am now and forevermore wooden potatoes. Brilliant. And there's no way to abbreviate it either. Someone, some people have called me like Woody before, which I'm fine with, but there's like I, at least three Woodies that I know on YouTube already, so that doesn't work. Um, finally, your favourite hobby besides gaming. Uh, I used to play a lot of badminton, but not so much anymore. The most recent kind of hobby-ish thing I, I, I could say that I do is uh, something that I mentioned in uh, a Tomb Raider episode recently. Um, geocaching is something I did. I was doing a lot back when I was on my apprenticeship. Um, and I would love to start doing it again, actually. My brother moved house recently, and there's some around near his, and I, I kind of want to go out and grab those with him. Uh, geocaching is this thing where it's really cool, guys. If you're... A, a, 
outdoorsy at all, I guarantee you should go and do this because they're all over the place. Basically, it's a website. If you go to it, geocaching.com, I think, or just Google it. Um, it's essentially this idea where people put boxes, containers, filled with trinkets and cool little stuff in them right and then they hide them around the world the real world out in your backyard out out anywhere right in public places and then what they do is they will mark on like google maps or something the location of it right the general location of it with like a hint on how to find it and then you can go onto geocache and you can sign up and it's, it's totally free you don't have to spend any money or anything but you can go and then you can track down these caches and you can find them and as an example the very first cache i ever found was when i was on my apprenticeship we were bored we were having a look um and there's like a bus stop that i walked past every single day when i was getting to the office block where 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 i was doing the apprenticeship at every single day i walked past it It was busy as hell like next to a massive building of its own loads of people always used to go there um and i knew about this bus stop and i started looking at the geocaching and it said that there was a cache there at the bus stop and it was only like a five minutes away so we all went out for lunch and had a look and um, we looked and we looked and we looked at this bus stop and we were like, no, this isn't done. This is stupid. It's never going to be there. But then, like, at the last, obviously the last second, because you don't keep looking once you found something. But, like, after ages, we found, like, hidden in this tiny little thing at the bus stop, like, right up at the top in the middle behind this weird thing. Um, like, we just pushed our fingers in and this little tub came out. This tiny little tub came out. And you can open it up. And uh, inside, there's like a log of every per- every geocacher that's ever found it, and they write like little notes, and they'll sign it. Um, and there might be like cool little stuff in there as well that you can take for yourself, but it's you know it's good it's courtesy to put something else of your own back in. So we put some weird stuff from like the company where we were at in it, and we took something. And what you can do is then take that trinket and then maybe put it in another cache. And what some people do is they'll keep moving this item along like and it will go miles like we found like a lego man that had come from germany and it had gone to like spain and somewhere else and now it had come to like my fucking little town in the south of england and it was just in this random place on on a street when we went to find it and we grabbed it for ourselves. and the idea of those is like they go really far away and then you're going to try and send them back it's it's so cool so you know if you've got a dog or something go out and walk it you will not you will be shocked how many of them there are and some people set up really interesting ones like quests, like where they'll have um, like a, a whole series of caches and you find the first one. It's got like a clue for the next one. And then you go to the next and the next and the next. And the idea is you're like, like, I don't know. I live in England, so we've got a lot of really nice countryside. But it'll take you through these weird places like across rivers and you've got to climb across falling down trees to get to stuff. And slowly you'll, you'll basically go on this like mini adventure thing. And it's as close as you're ever going to get to like a real life quest um in the real world it's fantastic so good i I very much enjoy i haven't done it recently uh you know if i ever was the kind of channel that would vlog a lot i would so i would like vlog geocaches i'd do like one geocache a week or something we go out and have a look that'd be so cool Uh, but yeah so that's a bit of a hobby i do um i was a little bit worried about a question like that until i thought of that because you know in a weird way youtube is my hobby and then people are saying well what's your other hobby and it's like most people for most of my life i've never had an answer to what's your hobby i don't think many people have answers to what's your hobby because you know i i always find it funny when you see someone's like they're like oh what's your hobby and it's like oh going to the movies hang that's my phone hanging out with with my friends it's like oh they, those aren't hobbies we all know they're not hobbies but you have to put it on your cv anyway but yeah so anyway i've got two at least i can talk about but yeah geocaching Okay, guys, I'm actually talking to you post-commentated at the moment. Um, I'm going to end the first part here. I ended up speaking for coming up on seven hours uh, for the original thing, but uh, obviously because stuff's going to get edited out, it will probably only end up around maybe six and a half hours or maybe even only around six hours in total. So, uh, But that doesn't mean a lot of episodes. As much as I'd love to put out a six-hour video, I even found myself getting bored of myself talking here. I really did. The, the answer where I was just talking about YouTube and stuff for ages, oh, my God. Um, but, you know, there's some interesting stuff anyway. I will be putting it all out, don't worry, but I'm just going to do it in separate parts. So this will be the first part. It's still a particularly long video, so this is the thousand. Thank you very much for watching. If you really have listened to all the way here, um, I do very much applaud you for that. There is still some interesting stuff to come. Uh, I give, like I mentioned that video that I might show, which I've yet to edit in, actually. Um, and I also talk a little bit more about my name and stuff, because so many people are asking for that. So anyway, um, yeah, that will come in later parts. So thank you very much for watching, really, sincerely. Um, I do a bit of a thank you at the end of the whole thing anyway, but uh, I really do appreciate everyone's support over all the videos. I'll ramble about it again later, but thanks, and I will catch you for part two if you care to join me. Cheers, guys.